program studi PBT saya banyak belajar tidak hanya terkait uh, pemulihan konvensional tetapi juga uh, jalur bioteknologi dan juga mutasi dan juga manipulasi genetiknya Saat ini saya sedang meneliti tentang kelapa, khususnya di bidang molekuler uh, Saat ini saya menggunakan marka SSR dan SNSD melalui gen pertambahan tinggi tanaman Motivasi saya memasuki program studi ini adalah untuk mengeksplor lebih dalam lagi keragaman tanaman kelapa oleh karena itu saya melakukan penelitian di bedang molekuler ini Motivasi saya memasuki program studi pemulihan dan biotechnologi tanaman di mana saya ingin mengeksplor diri dan mendapatkan pengalaman dari dosen-dosen pengajar yang profesional di bidangnya Motivasi saya memasuki program studi pemulihan dan biotechnologi tanaman adalah karena fasilitas yang ada di PD ini sangat lengkap Motivasi saya uh, mengambil program ini adalah saya ingin menciptakan varietas tanaman yang bermanfaat bagi umat manusia. Saat ini saya sudah memasuki semester 2 dan sedang melakukan penggaluran tanaman jagung. Alasan saya masuk jurusan program studi ini adalah saya ingin menjadi breeder yang handal. Dan dosen-dosen di program studi pemulihan dan bioteknologi ini sangat unggul dan kompeten. Yang menarik dari program studi ini adalah saya dan teman-teman bisa belajar tentang pemulihan secara konvensional dan juga bioteknologi dari dosen-dosen yang handal serta telah menghasilkan inovasi-inovasi yang baru dan mutakhir dalam bidangnya. Riset-riset yang dilakukan di program studi pemulihan dan bioteknologi tanaman ini uh, difasilitasi dengan fasilitas yang cukup memadai serta lengkap. Oleh karena itu, penelitian di bidang ini uh, dapat berjalan dengan lancar serta menghasilkan inovasi-inovasi yang mutakhir. Penyelenggaraan proses studi pada Program studi pemulihan dan bioteknologi tanaman didukung oleh para dosen yang sangat berkualitas, prasarana pembelajaran yang sangat baik, kebun percobaan dan laboratorium yang terkelola dengan sangat baik, serta atmosfer akademik yang sangat kondusif. Di program studi pemulihan dan bioteknologi tanaman ini, kami menempah anak bangsa untuk menjadi pemulia tanaman yang handal melalui pendekatan pemulihan konvensional maupun bioteknologi di tingkat seluler maupun molekuler. Indonesia membutuhkan SDM SDM yang handal di bidang pemulihan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Karena itu, melalui program studi pemulihan dan bioteknologi tanaman Sekolah Pasca Sarjana IPB, kami siap untuk mendidik anak bangsa. Program studi pemulihan dan bioteknologi tanaman mendidik calon-calon pemulia tangguh yang mempunyai latar belakang ilmu yang kuat dan pengalaman yang mumpuni dalam bidang pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman, baik pengalaman di lapangan maupun di laboratorium. Oleh karena itu, mari bergabung bersama kami di program studi ini. Mari bergabung bersama kami. Studi lanjut di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman Sekolah Pasar Sarjana Institut Pertanian Bung. Ayo, mari bergabung di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Ayo, bergabung bersama kami di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Mari bergabung di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Ayo, bergabung bersama kami di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Mari bergabung di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Mari bergabung di program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman. Mari teman-teman bersama kita bergabung pada program studi pemuliaan dan bioteknologi tanaman Sekolah Pasca Sarjana IPB.
Yang juga paling penting, seperti mengembangkan benih berkualitas hasil penelitian yang menjadi ciri khas kami. Jarak dan medan yang harus ditempuh bukan halangan bagi kami untuk terjun langsung ke lapangan. Kadang penuh keringat, kadang ditemani terik yang menyengat. Tak masalah, karena disinilah perjalanan kami bersamamu dimulai. Percobaan demi percobaan kami lakukan bersama untuk mencari mana varietas terbaik nantinya. Yang kami rawat sepenuh hati dalam pengawasan terbaik agar tiap benihnya mampu menyerap nutrisi bumi sepenuhnya hingga mereka terus tumbuh sehat sampai hasil panen terlihat prosesnya memang panjang dan tak mudah tetapi dengan inilah benih-benih terpilih sampai kegenggamanmu untuk kemudian dikemas menjadi produk cap panah merah yang akan membantu petani-petani selanjutnya kami sadar ada banyak hal yang masih harus dilakukan untuk maju bersamamu Karenanya, pelatihan tercipta untuk kami Supaya bisa selalu siaga membantumu Dan untukmu, kembangkan kemampuan bertani Dengan bantuan ilmu serta teknologi terkini Kami juga selalu siap menjawab setiap pertanyaanmu Di setiap pendampingan yang kamu perlukan Kami ada untukmu dan ketika kami melihatmu berhasil, mendapat kesempatan, serta mencapai apa yang kamu mimpikan, itulah pencapaian terbesar kami dalam menjadi sahabat yang paling baik bagimu. Terima kasih telah berjalan bersama kami selama 30 tahun ini. Mari terus menjadi sahabat dalam berpuluh tahun mendatang. Iswesit Indonesia, sahabat petani, yang paling baik Semangat pagi sahabat semua Jumpa lagi di M Syukur IPB channel Kali ini kita akan Ngobrol dengan mahasiswa Magister program studi eh, Pemuliaan dan Bioteknologi Tanaman eh, IPB eh, Penelitian tentang Merigol di Pasir Saronggi Mas Ade Bukhori Baik, eh, selamat pagi Pak Syukur pagi. Terima kasih Ya, Waalaikumsalam Bapak uh, Terima kasih Bapak atas kesempatannya uh, Saya Ade Buhori Merupakan mahasiswa Magister S2 Program Pemulihan dan Bioteknologi Tanaman hmm. uh, Sekarang sudah menginjak semester 3 Mau ke semester 4 ini Oh masih semester 4 ya? <laughs> iya masih semester 4 ya, Sahabat semua uh, Mas Ade ini sedang melakukan penelitian Tentang uh, mer Merigold Hasil uh, mutasi dan juga hasil persilangan hmm. Untuk dua spesies Nanti dia akan uh, cerita tentang penelitiannya uh, Jadi uh, penelitian ini uh, Dibimbing oleh uh, Saya sebagai uh, Anggota komisi ya iya, Pak. Ketua komisinya Bu, Bu Syarifah Is Aisyah Isa dan Bu Dewi Sukma Iya dengan Bu Dewi Sukma. Ya Mas Ade bisa diceritakan uh, Apa saja topik penelitian tentang Merigold ini Baik Uh, kalau topik penelitian saya itu uh, mengi, mengevaluasi ya Prof uh, bagaimana uh, karakter morfologi maupun sampai ke pigmen mm -hmm. juga untuk 
uh, beberapa genotipe genotipe mer- uh, hasil-hasil pemulihan marigold kita mm-hmm. yang sudah dilakukan selama ini melalui persilangan dan juga mutasi mm-hmm. di dataran tinggi dan rendah. Dataran tinggi dan dataran rendah. Iya betul. Di, uh, ketinggiannya berapa tempat di sini? Uh, berapa berapa ketinggian? Ya, untuk di dataran rendah yang sendiri uh, itu ketinggiannya sekitar 220 mdpl, mm-hmm. sedangkan dataran tingginya uh, kurang lebih 1.100. Oke. Okay. Ada berapa genotip ya Mas Adi yang diuji? Di ya untuk yang kita uji di sini ada lima, uh, sebelas ya sebelas genotip ya. uh, harapan kita. Hmm. Untuk empatnya itu merupakan pembandingnya begitu. Empat merupakan pembanding hmm. dan sebelas uh, genotip yang diuji ya sahabat semua. Dan uh, tadi disampaikan pengujian dilakukan di dua lokasi ya dua lokasi dan dua ketinggian sekaligus ya. Dataran rendah 200 sampai 250, 220 ya. 220 di atas permukaan laut dan dataran tinggi eh, 1.100. 1.100 di kebun percobaan IPB Pasir Sarungge. Nah ini menggunakan 11 eh, genotipe hasil eh, perakitan tim eh, kita dan eh, ini perbanyakannya menggunakan biji atau vegetatif? Ah ya ini perbanyakannya menggunakan vegetatif prosesnya. Jadi semua genotip yang digunakan ini adalah perbanyakan vegetatif ya sahabat semua. Dan eh, mengapa? Ini ini berarti eh, orientasinya atau arahnya adalah pelepasan varietas ya, untuk betul, yang eh, pembiak vegetatif berarti ya? Iya betul Pak, pelepasan hmm. varietas untuk pembiak vegetatif. Berat, eh, harus ke vegetatif gitu? Iya, hmm. jadi kan untuk eh, pembelian itu alurnya sangat panjang sekali ya Prof. Hmm. Bisa kita capai eh, 5 sampai 6 tahun mungkin atau lebih begitu ya Prof. Karena kita juga harus membentuk populasi galur murni terlebih dahulu hmm. untuk membentuk varietas-varietas hibrida. Nah, ataupun varietas-varietas uh, tersebut uh, mudah untuk disila uh, penyibukan sendiri. Nah, namun untuk marigold ini sendiri, uh, tipe bunga yang diharapkan itu adalah tipe bunga yang oligulet seluruhnya atau mm-hmm. kita kenal dengan uh, bentuk bunga yang uh, keseluruhannya bunga pita seperti itu. Bunga pita. Bunga pita. Nah, hmm. nah uh, permasalahannya apa kalau kalau misalnya Tadi kan berbanyak secara vegetatif. Mm-hmm. Kalau dengan biji bagaimana nah, bunga pita ini? Nah bunga pita ini Prof, uh, polennya tidak ada, uh, ada tetapi sangat sedikit. sedikit sangat ya. sedikit kemungkinan munculnya polen ada di bunga pita tersebut. Hmm. Untuk tagetes erecta. Tagetes erecta yeah. ya. Jadi dengan uh, polen yang sedikit ya berarti uh, kemungkinan membentuk bijinya, selfing itu mm-hmm. rendah. Begitu, rendah ya. sekali Prof. Jadi ya. tidak mudah untuk menghasilkan okay. uh, varietas yang diperbanyak di, 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 di dengan biji ya biasanya. Mm-hmm. Uh, hibrida ya, ya betul, uh, Mas Ade hibrida uh, ada tipe bunga uh, sebagai jantan begitu uh, kemudian tipe bunga yang pita tadi sebagai betina, sebagai betina. Begitu, ya. nah uh, sahabat semua tadi bahwa perbanyakannya menggunakan biji ini untuk tipe pita itu tidak mudah sehingga orientasinya pelepasan varietas itu uh, ke arah uh, perbanyakan vegetatif ya sahabat semua nah selain daripada itu apa 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 manfaat bagi petani kalau diperbanyak secara vegetatif? Iya betul, kalau manfaat bagi petani itu nanti petani akan bisa memperbanyak sendiri. Perbanyak uh, sendiri. Iya betul, Prof. Karena kan uh, kita mengetahui ya, Prof, kalau untuk di Indonesia sendiri, hmm. uh, benih yang dikomersialkan di Indonesia itu tidak ada yang berasal dari Indonesia. Hmm. Sehingga ini menjadi kesempatan kita hmm. untuk bagaimana kita bisa meningkatkan gitu ya, Prof, uh, hmm. potensi uh, varietas Indonesia sendiri dan juga uh, bagaimana uh, kapasitas petani begitu untuk hmm. meningkatkan SDM petani itu untuk memperbanyak. Hmm. Uh, klon-klon dari varietas-varietas unggul tersebut begitu. Ya, tadi disampaikan Mas Ade bahwa uh, semua varietas yang beredar itu adalah semua adalah uh, impor ya kelihatannya. Uh, kalau kita lihat deskripsi pelepasan varietas meskipun dilepas di dalam negeri, tapi pemulihannya adalah berasal dari luar negeri itu indikasi bahwa dia adalah varietas uh, impor. Nah, uh, Mas Ade ini dari 11 yang diuji tadi, apakah uh, ada yang kira-kira punya prospek yang bagus gitu iya. untuk dilepas. Iya. Hmm. Ada beberapa genotipe kita hmm. yang sangat baik ya, Prof. Hmm. Uh, untuk kita uh, melihatnya itu dari bentuk bunganya bagaimana hmm. yang disukai pasar, kemudian bagaimana ketahanannya juga. Hmm. Nah, begitu dan juga bagaimana uh, hasilnya hmm. uh, bobotnya. Untuk di kita sendiri kita memiliki baib 2 dan baib juga dua, ya. baib 5 yang uh, baib cukup baik. Baib 2 dan baib 5. Ya, sahabat hmm. semua di depan kita ini ini baib 2 ya Mas Iya, ya? baib 2 sangat baik sekali bunganya. di tempat lain bunganya sudah mulai layu ya. begitu ya karena curah hujannya sangat tinggi di sini. Uh, hampir setiap hari hujan ya di Pasir Sarongge ini. 
dan kita lihat kalau kita bandingkan dengan empat varietas pembanding, varietas pembanding bunganya sudah habis semua ya. Iya betul. Dan dia masih Selama. masih lebat begitu ya di sini sahabat semua bisa dilihat sebagai uh, latar depan dari kita ini ini adalah baik dua yang kalau kita daftarkan varietasnya namanya apa ini uh, uh, sudah malah sudah malah orangnya satu sudah malah orangnya satu mm-hmm. ya sudah malah orange ya jadi uh, dan ternyata Uh, selain daripada ketahanannya juga bagus ya terhadap curah hujan tinggi juga kelihatannya lebat banget ya iya pak lebat sekali Maaf, alhamdulillah <laughs> ini diperbanyak secara vegetatif dan kita uh, dengan pembanding pun kita perbanyak secara vegetatif juga pembanding sehingga kita bisa lihat apakah dia punya kemampuan yang uh, bagus ya bisa mendandingi setidaknya uh, perform dari pembanding yang sudah dilepas ya nah Uh, Mas Ade berarti ada baik dua, tadi ada baik tiga gitu ya? Baik lima, Pak. Baik lima, ya? mm-hmm. oh baik lima. Uh, apa namanya? Itu untuk targetes erekta, Pak. Targetes erekta. erekta. Ya? Karena kan kita di sini mengujinya untuk uh, dua spesies juga, Pak. Hmm. Targetes erekta dan targetes patula. Targetes erekta dan targetes hmm. patula yang banyak beredar targetes erekta. Iya, targetes erekta, Pak. Erekta ya. ya. Hmm. Patula ada tapi belum ada varietas yang lain ya. Tes, tes. Jadi. Uh, Kita itu yang banyak ya, dengar Bu Neng, ya. Bali ya untuk berbagai keperluan, keperluan wisata, hotel dan juga untuk uh, ibadah ya keperluannya 8 sampai 20 ton per hari ya sahabat semua dan itu semua menggunakan tegetes erecta. Ya, ya, betul, Tapi ada masalah kan di tegetes erecta untuk variasi variasi bunga ya? Iya betul Prof. Hmm, bunga bunga warna warnanya seperti apa yang kalau tegetes erecta? Nah kalau tegetes erecta itu hanya sampai saat ini yang kita temukan adalah hmm. yang beredar warna oranya hmm. keemasan atau gold Masan. kita ketahui dengan sebagai gold. Kemudian warna kuning dan juga uh, putih ke krim gitu Prof. Putih Jadi krem. belum putih murni tapi lebih hmm. ke krim gitu. Belum ada merahnya ya? Belum Prof. Belum, belum ada, ada merah. Merah, merah hanya di patula. Merah itu ada di patula ya. Jadi uh, Kalau ingin mentransfer dari patula ke erekta, apakah memungkinkan Mas Ade? Bisa Pak, sangat Bisa, memungkinkan. Ya. Dia, uh, dia spesies yang berbeda ya? Iya, dengan spesies yang berbeda kita melakukan hmm. persilangan interspesifik. Hmm. Bisa. Kelihatannya secara internasional sudah ada juga ya Pak? Sudah ada Pak. Uh, Namanya Zenith, Zenith Red, Red iya. kalau tidak salah ya. Nah jadi Zenith Red itu adalah interspecific hybridization, persilangan interspesifik. Uh, apa spesifik antara tagetes erecta dengan tagetes patula uh, namanya zenith red jadi uh, bung ukuran bunganya menjadi lebih besar kemudian juga bisa tipe bunga pitanya lebih lebih banyak bunga pitanya di yeah. situ tapi warna merahnya bisa terintroduksi yeah, betul. jadi kita juga bisa mudah-mudahan ini uh, dari hasil persilangan spesifik yang kami juga kita juga melakukan yeah, ya kita juga melakukan oh. mudah-mudahan kita mendapatkan uh, varietas yang dari erekta yang punya variasi warna yang lebih banyak lagi ya khususnya adalah warna merah sahabat semua nah uh, tadi Mas Ade menguji di uh, dua lokasi ya ini untuk keperluan apa Mas ini untuk keperluan uh, bagaimana sih sebenarnya kita um, ketika kita akan memberikan kepada petani sebaiknya itu ditanam di mana begitu hmm. walaupun pelepasan varietas untuk tanaman ya sebenarnya tidak membutuhkan uji adaptasi ya Prof sebenarnya hmm. hanya observasi hmm. namun kita lakukan ini untuk uh, nanti uh, ke, uh, sasaran kita untuk kepada petani nanti sebaiknya uh, di level ketinggian di level apa? ketinggian berapa iya, begitu sebaiknya iya. ditanam usul dari kita begitu. nah jadi memang ya sahabat semua untuk tanaman hias varietas varietasnya tidak dilakukan uji adaptasi hanya uji observasi saja jadi hanya di satu lokasi melakukan deskripsi dibandingkan dengan pembanding pembandingan pun tidak harus ditanam ya sehingga uh, relatif lebih mudah sesungguhnya Tapi tadi sampai ke Mas Ade pengujian ini untuk mengetahui daya adaptasi galur-galur kita ini jika ditanam datar rendah seperti apa performnya dataran tinggi seperti apa performnya ya jadi maka diuji kelihatannya tidak hanya dua lokasi tetapi eh, di satu lokasi di dataran tinggi juga dua musim ya iya betul tanam. dua musim menanam. kita ingin betul. tahu sehingga kita ada tiga unit nah kalau tiga unit nanti bisa kita lihat bagaimana eh, apa menggunakan analisis stabilitas kelihatannya di saya ya, ya. Apakah itu dengan AMI atau menggunakan Finlay mm-hmm. Wilkinson? Nah, selain daripada itu kan satu bab ya. <laughs> ada, ada yang lain? <laughs> iya betul. Yang lain itu uh, kita mengevaluasi hasil-hasil mm-hmm. galur hibrida interspesifik, prof. Mm-hmm. Interspesifik uh, maupun uh, intraspesifik. Interspesifik. Oh, jadi uh, berarti disilangkan juga ya antara yang patula dengan erecta untuk dievaluasi. Iya betul, tadi. prof. Uh, dengan pembanding zenith red tadi ya. Iya betul. Oke. Okay. 
uh, itu bab sendiri yang lain apa tadi mengamatin itu juga ya uh, apa kandungan pigmen pigmen iya itu uh, di chapter uji uh, analisis stabilitas prof Okay. Ya, jadi kita mengamati bagaimana sih sebenarnya apakah ada juga pengaruh begitu ya Prof uh, di tempat, tempat tersebut kualitas pigmennya kualitas pigmennya apakah karena kita lihat ya untuk warna merah sendiri uh, ketika ditanam secara uh, kelihatan mata begitu yeah. uh, secara fenotipik dia akan memudar begitu tapi okay. uh, bagaimana dengan kandungannya kita akan hmm. lihat kuantifikasinya juga kan dengan uh, kalorimeter dan juga bagaimana dengan pigmennya untuk meng, hmm. uh, konfirmasi begitu ya yeah. Baik, eh, sahabat semua, sekarang Mas Adek sudah semester 3. 3 mau ke 4. 3 masuk ke semester 4, penelitiannya masih panjang ya? Iya, sepertinya. <laughs> Dan lulus semester 4. Amin ya, Bapak Alami. Paling lambat semester 5 lah, ya biar iya. jauh dari lulus tepat waktu. Gitu. Walaupun belum semester 4 lulusnya, tapi eh, mudah-mudahan tidak terlalu panjang ya. Iya, betul. <laughs> Dan eh, sahabat semua, eh, ini adalah penelitian yang... Tidak banyak dilakukan ya oleh mahasiswa magister di dalam negeri juga ya kelihatannya ya Mas Ade Kita harapkan dari informasi yang diperoleh oleh Mas Ade ini kita bisa uh, daftarkan varitasnya Kita sudah daftar tujuh ya sebenarnya Sudah Prof, kita sudah nah, Dari informasi tujuh. Mas Ade ini kita bisa lepas juga varitasnya Terutama tadi yang uh, sudah malah, sudah malah oranye Ya sudah malah oranye satu Demikian saya kira pertemuan kita sahabat semua ngobrol kita dengan mahasiswa magister Mas Ade ya sampai jumpa di lain kesempatan semangat selalu assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh waalaikumsalam Semua jumpa lagi di M Syukuri PB Channel kali ini kita akan ngobrol tentang Merigold ya kalau bahasa Balinya disebut dengan gemitir ya bersama uh, peneliti uh, tanaman hias ya pemulia tanaman hias uh, menggunakan pendekatan bioteknologi Ibu Dr Dewi Sukma <laughs> sebentar lagi akan menjadi guru besar ya. Amin, amin, ya, Bu. amin. <laughs> Semangat pagi Bu. Semangat, Semangat pagi Prof Syukur terima kasih sekali nih pagi ini kita di uh, greenhouse nya Prof Syukur dengan warna-warni dari gold ya Pak ya ya, ya sahabat semua uh, apa uh, perlu kita ketahui bahwa kebutuhan merigold khususnya ada di Bali uh, sangat tinggi ya bisa dibayangkan uh, apa uh, sekitar 8 ton ya per hari uh, untuk berbagai keperluan tentunya ya menunjang pariwisata, kemudian keperluan ibadah dan lain sebagainya. Dan uh, Bu Dewi ternyata hmm? uh, merigol yang beredar, varitas-varitasnya itu hasil rakitan pemulia dari luar negeri semua ternyata ya, ada betul. sekitar 11 ya varitas yang sudah beredar uh, dengan warna kuning, orange dan gold itu semua kalau kita lihat pemulianya itu semua dari Thailand ya. kelihatannya. Jadi ketergantungan benih keluar besar sekali ya Pak. Besar ya? sekali ya. Uh, tergantung kepada apa namanya varitas yang dihasilkan oleh uh, apa pemulia dari luar ya, ya Bude. Nah oleh karena itu uh, Pemda Bali khususnya uh, Gubernur. Bali ya, ya Pak Dr. Wayan Koster ya. sangat concern akan hal ini ya. Beliau uh, memberikan amanat kepada kita nih, amanat ya. yang luar biasa ini <laughs> kepada tim kita. Ya. Uh, saya uh, kemudian Ibu Dr. Dewi Sukma, kemudian Dr. Ibu Dr. Sari Faiz Aisyah, kemudian ada Profesor uh, Dewa, Dewa, Murah ya. Dewa Murah Suprapta dari hmm. Universitas Udayana yeah. ini diberi mandat mandat apa amanah ini diberi mandat untuk merakit varitas merigold gumitir ya kalau di Bali yeah. khusus ya untuk uh, Bali dan 
karya anak bangsa ya. <laughs> karya anak bangsa ya, ya. Bu Dewi nah jadi sejak tahun 2019 ya ya betul 2019, 2019 akhir ya 2019 akhir ya September gitu ya, ya. September beliau mengajak kita diskusi ke Bali ya. kemudian ayo tim ini harus buat tiga tahun bisa enggak Wah, <laughs> luar biasa ya. nah jadi uh, beliau menginginkan varietas yang dihasilkan untuk uh, petani Bali khususnya uh, dan tentu untuk masyarakat Indonesia itu juga tidak memberatkan petani artinya petani bisa memperbanyak sendiri ya, betul, begitu sih. ya dengan benih tersebut ya. nah alternatifnya tentu kita rakit lalu kemudian benih itu bukan benih berida tentunya ya, ya. Uh, uh, Bu Dewi ya. tapi benih OP atau uh, apa benih yang diperbanyak secara vegetatif ya sahabat semua ya. nah ini waktu itu kita pendekatannya ada tiga ya Bu Dewi apa saja pendekatan yang kita lakukan ya Masa, pertama sesuai. yang uh, bidangnya prof syukur sekali gitu ya hmm. tentang konvensional hmm. breeding, breeding ya, ya. konvensional hmm. breeding kemudian yang kedua pendekatan mutasi di dunianya Ibu Esarifa, ya. ya kemudian Prof Sukur melibatkan saya untuk uh, bagian uh, pendekatan dengan bioteknologi. bioteknologi. Ya, betul. Ya. Uh, Oke, okay. jadi ada tiga pendekatan sahabat semua konvensional breeding melalui persilangan konvensional, persilangan buatan, hmm. kemudian mutasi, ya mutasi itu merubah uh, karakter uh, tertentu warna bunga khususnya yeah. adalah uh, melalui uh, mutasinya mutasi fisik dan mutasi biokimia yeah, yang betul. dilakukan oleh Bu Isaripa dan juga uh, pendekatan bioteknologi, yeah, ya, pendekatan betul. bioteknologi itu untuk merakit uh, varietas-varietas baru dengan warna yang beda gitu yang warna yang uh, tertentu lalu yang penting juga adalah perbanyakannya ya, ya bisa betul. dengan kultur jaringan dan ya, lain sebagainya betul. sahabat semua uh, yang diinginkan uh, uh, gubernur Pak Wayan adalah ya. selain warna yang sudah ada tentu kita rakit ya, ya. untuk keperluan petani di Bali ya. juga warna tertentu ya Bu ya. Dewi <laughs> warna merah, merah. Putih. warna putih makanya kita menggunakan merah putih kita, ya sahabat semua ini, uh, our dream color <laughs> dream. dream color ya Indonesia merah banget putih. ya Indonesia banget Kebangsaan jadi kalau gitu ya. uh, kita membayangkan kalau di Bali 17 Agustusan itu formasi merah putih merah dari putih, gold merigo, gitu ya itu cita-cita kita semua cita-cita gitu ya. kita jadi selain daripada perakitan varita sendiri dihasilkan oleh anak bangsa warnanya pun bangsa banget bangsa, iya, bangsa, bangsa banget bangsa Indonesia, Indonesia banget, Indonesia banget gitu ya. dan juga menginginkan warna hitam itu Wah. juga <laughs> tapi lalu kemarin ada juga ya dari dosen AGH hmm. mungkin selain daripada warna bagus juga itu diberi Wanginya sentuhan ya? ke aroma, aroma. Wah, itu dia teknologi banget itu nggak iya, mungkin karena, karena di Merigold uh, sudah punya aromanya sendiri uh, uh, dan tidak semua orang suka ya. Yeah, Jadi uh, mungkin uh, uh, kalau yang tidak yang pertama mungkin kalau warna yang tidak disukai itu bisa kita hilangkan. Uh, uh, Kemudian bisa juga uh, diganti dengan war tiga, wangi baru. Wangi gitu baru ya. ya ini kan biasa untuk bedding plants. Ya wangi maksudnya. Jadi aroma uh, yang tidak disukai. Yeah. Ya. Jadi ada dua alternatif ya sahabat semua. Huh? Alternatif pertama merubah mindset orang bahwa uh. aroma ini enak. <laughs> Tapi itu kan sulit. <laughs> yeah. nah, atau membuat aroma baru ya, nah ini jadi saya bilang ke Bu Dewi bagaimana kalau satu kuntum ini ditaruh di kamar satu ya. ruangan aromanya ya. semerba gitu menyebabkan maling takut masuk atau malingnya betah di dalam <laughs> betah di karena wangi jadi bisa diambil dari gennya sedap malam hmm. kemudian apa kopi barangkali oh, ya kopi bisa kemudian, juga kemudian uh, anggrek juga ada ya anggrek juga ada ada palenopsis yang wangi atau uh, apa melati ya melati nah ya. itu juga tantangan ya bagi kita ya. kalau misalnya aromanya itu uh, ini tidak hanya untuk kepentingan di Bali kalau aromanya ya. sudah semua berubah gitu untuk kepentingan luar ya, biasa betul. gitu ya. ya nah jadi sahabat semua uh, kami sejak tahun 2019 itu melalui tiga pendekatan itu mulai merakit uh, paritas dengan menggunakan plasma nuva yang ada tentunya gitu ya. ya melalui persilangan tadi kemudian melalui mutasi melalui uh, bioteknologi ya. gitu ya nah di tahun 2022 ya, Dua, 2022 ya. ini kita sudah ya. mendapatkan berapa bu? Dewi? 6 ya, 6, 7 ya? 6 sampai 7, 7, 7 varitas. 7 varitas ya, yang sudah terdaftar. Ada namanya. Wah, namanya sudah malah sudah ya, sahabat malah. semua ini adalah nama yang diberikan oleh gubernur, 
eh, Pak Wayan. Makasih Pak Wayan. Ini namanya sudah malah. <laughs> sudah malah. <laughs> sudah malah itu nama yang eh, harapan banget gitu ya. ya eh, menurut Pak Wayan. Hmm. Maka kita beri nama sudah malah emas, sudah malah barak, gitu barak putih, ya. sudah malah kuning, kun, sudah malah ini apa orange ya. Orange, ya. Sudah malah orange dan eh, sudah malah satunya lagi Pak. Emas putih. putih. Uh, merah sudah sudah merah orange. merah sama orange ya sudah mulai orange oke okay. nah uh, jadi ini ini adalah salah satunya nah, sahabat yeah. semua ini adalah yeah. sudah malah emas ya yeah, ini uh, kita lakukan mutasi kemudian mutasi dari mg 04 ya yeah. uh, nama plasma yang kita koleksi kemudian kita silangkan dengan mg 02 Ya, hmm. kemudian kita selfing yeah. dibiarkan menyebut sendiri di dalam greenhouse yeah. kemudian kita perbanyak yang uh, bagus-bagus oh. yang bagus yang kita pilih yang bagusnya kemudian yeah. kita uh, kita beri nama sudah malak emas yeah. nah ini sudah kita kirim ke Bali untuk diuji cobakan di di apa di skala terbatas ya yeah. di kebun percobaannya ini diameternya 8 kalau saya lihat 8, 8 cm kemarin 8 sampai 10 yeah. cm yeah. ya kemarin sudah dan, relatif uh, ini dengan varietas hibrida impor yes, ya yes jadi sudah oh, sudah setara oh, dengan varietas yeah. impor dan keunggulannya sebetulnya ini tidak mengandalkan benih generatif nah ya? oh, itu juga salah hmm. satu keunggulannya adalah petani bisa memperbanyak sendiri yeah. dan ini kalau kita lihat tingginya tidak berbeda ya dengan dengan yang yeah. diperbanyak secara generatif yeah. kemudian kita lakukan penelitian juga bagaimana perbanyakan vegetatifnya yeah. apa media tanamnya ya yeah. Bu Dewi yeah. kemudian apa pupuk yang diberikan berapa yeah. lama dan yeah. yang penting juga ini harus dilakukan hinching, hinching yeah. ya hinching selama dua bulan Karena ya. merigold ini sangat cepat berbunga ya yeah. begitu keluar tunas sudah langsung bunga jadi yeah. kalau masih tanamannya masih kecil bunganya yeah. tidak akan maksimal yeah. dan itu di fase-fase awal vegetatif kita perlu yeah. Yeah. Potes. Nah, sebetulnya sih mm -hmm. kalau untuk di pot yeah. ya bagus juga ditanam lima gitu lalu yeah. kemudian dia berbunga bareng nggak yeah, perlu dipincing juga bagus, bagus gitu ya nggak ya. untuk tinggi. pot plan ya pot pak plan. ya kalau untuk di produksi saya perlu perlu pincing dan yeah, itu okay. kita lakukan penelitian untuk itu gitu ya mm -hmm. dan uh, itu tadi keunggulan diameternya ini apa uh, besar gitu kemudian tentu karena yang kalau di Bali itu kan yang dijual dalam bentuk Uh, apa bobot ya per yeah, kilo per gitu kilo, ya. unik yeah. juga begitu ya sehingga yeah. perlu yang memang bobotnya besar jadi meskipun mm. diameternya besar juga harus kita cek kok kompaknya sehingga bobotnya yeah. uh, besar nah sekarang sudah mulai di, di, ditanam di Bali dan tahun 2023 kita mulai akan diseminasikan kepada petani yeah, gitu. nah, jadi uh, uh, apa uh, kemudian Bu Dewi Uh, karena diperbanyak secara vegetatif ya, berarti betul. kita bisa uh, menggunakan kultur jari kan Bu Ya, itu salah satu yang kita perlu perhatikan ya Prof Sukur karena ketika hmm. kita mengirim stek dari satu daerah ke daerah lain sebetulnya itu tidak aman ya. Tidak aman ya. Karena uh, kita beresiko untuk uh, menyebarkan patogen juga ya. Jadi okay. misalnya kalau patogen itu belum ada di Bali, kalau kita bawa stek uh, in vivo dari sini beresiko patogen baru. Karena itu kita Uh, semua varietas yang kita punya ini kita sudah ini in vitro uh, perbanyak in vitro jadi pertama yang akan kita introduksikan ke sana adalah bibit steril bibit steril ya, ya pengalaman ya. kemarin ya di bandara ya ya di bandara kita uh, membawa tanaman <laughs> tidak bisa uh, ketika kita membawa bibit botolan itu aman aman karena steril ya. itu aman jadi, dan juga uh, uh, untuk penyimpanan juga ya, ya betul. tidak mudah kalau tanaman dalam bentuk vegetatif dan cepat berbuka ya, gini kita harus punya konservasi konservasi bisa juga di, di, di dan juga sahabat semua luar biasanya lagi ternyata Pemda Bali dinas pertaniannya itu punya ya laboratorium kultur jaringan ya, ya Bu Dewi ya, ya. ya. E, kita jadi kita tinggal kita latih saja ya. mereka kemarin kita karena, sudah kirim asisten oh, sudah ke kirim asisten ke sana kita bawa botolan kemudian diajarkan di sana cara memperbanyaknya Banyaknya. sehingga nanti uh, dari balai benih atau dari dinas itu uh, bibit yang dikirim ke masyarakat itu adalah bibit yang steril okay. yang sehat ya yeah. jadi selain daripada stek nanti adalah juga dengan kultur jaringan di yeah, sana ya yeah. Uh, jadi apa namanya kita manfaatkan teknologi kekinian lah gitu ya hmm. uh, untuk itu. Nah sahabat semua uh, yang beredar memang sekarang warnanya kuning dan orange ya kuning hmm. orange emas kira-kira hmm. gerakannya itu Geradasi. dalam uh, ke, sebetulnya. Halo.
Assalamualaikum Pak Dekan. Salam. Selamat pagi. Selamat pagi. Pagi. Mbak Rahma masih mute. Silakan, Mbak. Okay, for all of the participants, we will start our agenda today. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello. Warm welcome to the webinar on plant breeding and biotechnology. I'm Rahmatunis Rumahfiroh, a master student of plant breeding and biotechnology department study program, your host for today. I also would like to greet the interim dean of Faculty of Agriculture, IPB University, Professor Suryawiyono, the head of agronomy and horticulture department. IPB University, Professor Edi Santosa, the coordinator of doctoral study program of plant breeding and biotechnology, Dr. Yudhiyanti Wahyu, the coordinator of magister study program of plant breeding and biotechnology, Termute, Mbak Rama. Saya kira ini saya, komputer saya. And of course, our distinguished speakers, Professor Wataru Sakamoto from Institute of Fine Plant Science and Resources, Okayama University, Japan. Dr. Triku Sumaring Tias from Genetic and Plant Breeding Division, Department of Agronomy and Horticulture, IPB University. Dr. Awang Maharijaya from Plant Biotechnology Division, Department of Agronomy and Horticulture, IPB University. And Mr. Murianto Paiman, SPMSE from East West Indonesia Company. Also, I would like to greet our moderators, Dr. Willy Bayuardi Suwarno and Professor Darde Effendi from Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Study Program, IPB University. Thank you also to Professor Ming Sair Chan and Professor Masaru Ahmed Takagi from Academia Sinica Biotechnology Center in Southern Taiwan and Professor Tetsuro Mimura that may join us today. And also for our lecturers from the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture Researcher and also students and colleges from other institutions. Welcome to our webinar. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Indonesia National Anthem, Indonesia Raya. Yes. 
Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, anyway, today's webinar is held in collaboration with Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Study Program, IPB University, and East West Indonesia, and also managed by Forsca BPT. And we are also grateful since today's webinar is the second out of the Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Series webinar in this year. And we hope this will become an ongoing agenda. So make sure to keep updated for the upcoming series, please. Today's webinar will be divided into two sessions, which featuring four speakers and two moderators to elaborate the topics. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me first to read the agenda for today. The first agenda is praying. The second one is welcoming speech from the head of agronomy and horticulture department. The next agenda is welcoming speech and opening. And the fourth is the core of our agenda, that is seminar session and discussion led by our moderators. And the last one is closing. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we move further to the next agenda, let's start with prayer. And I would like to invite Mr. Ahmad Perlaungan to lead the praying. Mr. Ahmad, time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> Allahumma ya ajim al-sultan, ya qadim al-ihsan, ya da'im al-ni'am, ya kasir al-jul, ya wasi' al-azim, ya hafi al-lutfi, ya hadim ala ta'jil sallu ya rabbi ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala ali wa rada'an sahabati azma'in. Allahumma laka al-hamdu shukra wa laka al-manna fadada wa anta rabbana haqqa. ونحن عبيدك رقب وأنت لم تزل لذلك أحدا اللهم, يسر اللهم يا ميسر كل عسير ويا جائر كل كشير ويا صاحب كل فريد ويا مكني كل فكير يا الله يا رحمن كبادامو لح كامي مهن كبايكا كبادامو لح كامي مهن كبركاها Atas segala perencanaan kami, atas segala upaya kami. Ya Allah, Ya Rahim, tolonglah kami, lindungilah kami dari segala kesalahan. Asbun Allah wa ni'mal wakil, ni'mal maula wa ni'mal nasir. La hala wa la kuwata illa bilal alil azim. Rabbana zulamna anfusana wa illam taghfir lana wa tarhamna lana kunanna minal khasirin. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta sami'un alim. ربنا علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم سبحانك ربك رب إجاة أمي سيكون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته أمين أمين يا رب العالمين Ladies and gentlemen The next agenda is Welcoming speech Without further ado I would like to invite the head of Agronomy and Horticulture Department, Professor Eddie Santosa. For Professor Eddie, time is yours. Thank you very much, Ba Rahmatun. My voice clear? Yes, Mr. Okay. Clear. Uh, <clears throat> good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I think today is very uh, nice day. I see in outside. It's very clear weather, although in Indonesia is a fasting time. Uh, Professor uh, Wataru, uh, as you know, uh, we have uh, to say refrain from taking food and drink during the daytime, but we have a party at the night time. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, welcome to our webinar and all participants and also uh, thank you very much for the organizing committee. Uh, 
this is a webinar conducted by the uh, Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Study Program and the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture and Faculty of Agriculture, IPB University. Uh, of course, uh, this is very important agenda conducted by the uh, department as part of introduction of the study programs. And of course, uh, this uh, meeting will not happen unless the participant from the Dr. Uh, Professor Dewi Sukma as uh, head of the study program and also Dr. Yudiwanti as head of the study program. First of all, thank you very much for invited uh, speaker, distinguished speaker, Professor Wataru Sakamoto from Okayama University, uh, Dr. Awang Maharijaya, and Ibu Dr. Tri Kusumaning Tias from IPB University, and uh, of course, a young generation, Mr. Murianto Paiman from East West Seed Indonesia. Also, thank you very much to our moderators, uh, Professor Darda Effendi and uh, Dr. Willy Bayuardi and uh, Ms. Rahmatun as host. I see from the participants, Professor Mingsar Chan and Professor Masaru Takagi. Good morning, Professor. Welcome to the uh, webinar. And also I see Professor Bambang Sabto Purwoko, Pak Dr. Master. Congratulations, Pak Dr. Master, for your promotion this week. Okay, uh, of course, we appreciate for supporting from Mr. Dean, Professor Suryo Yono, and we hope uh, you have some speech to open this meeting, uh, Mr. Dean. In short, uh, I think uh, everybody knows that biotechnology is very important because, uh, in my opinion, it is the future engine. So, and uh, we really on plant breeding and biotechnology to fulfill our need from agriculture uh, in food, feed, fiber, fuel, and something that uh, Professor Sukur present in this morning for fences, for our healing. I think it's very important. So in short, biotechnology is very important. And again, thank you very much for all participants for this uh, meeting. I hope all of us, uh, how to say, have a nice uh, webinar and uh, we will have a strong collaboration in the near future. I think uh, this is my short speech. Thank you very much. And uh, again, thank you very much for Dr. Uh, Yudiwanti and Professor Dave Sukma for organizing this uh, meeting and all the plant breeding and biotechnology members. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam. Thank you very much, Professor Eddie, for the speech. The next agenda is welcome speech and opening. I would like to invite the in the interim dean of the Faculty of Agriculture, Professor Suryo Wiono. Professor Suryo, the time is yours. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. First of all, as dean of Faculty of Agriculture, I would like to give a precision for study program of plant breeding and biotechnology of Department of uh, agronomy and horticulture for organizing this uh, event. Also for head of department professor Edi Santosa as host of this uh, webinar and counterpart of this seminar is West uh, this supporting this with support uh, 
this seminar. As we know, agriculture in the world and also in Indonesia, of course, has facing great challenges in uh, terms of uh, productivity and with the climate change and more limiting resources. So uh, in this uh, challenges, plant breeding and biotechnology play important role to uh, produce or to make a solution. This seminar hopefully can act as medium for sharing knowledge, experience, and furthermore, make cooperation and synergy among academia, government, farmers, and industries among participating institutions. Finally, we hope for success of this F event. And with the Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, uh, I officially open webinar on plant breeding and biotechnology. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam Thank you very much, Professor Suryo, for the speech and opening. Ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to our main agenda. But uh, before we move further to the next agenda, let's take a picture for the documentation of this meeting. And maybe Mas Aldi, may you help me and to take the photo, please? And also for the participants who are able to show your video, please open your video and camera, please. Okay, uh, Aldi and I will have for uh, documentation. In my screen, there are four, five uh, slides. So start from slides one. One, two, three. Slides two, one, two, three. Slides three, one, two, three. Slides four, and the last slides five. Okay, then Mbak Rahma. Thank you very much, Mas Zulfikar and Mas Aldi for helping me uh, to take the picture. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to our main agenda, that is the presentation and discussion session. The first two presentation and discussion will be moderated by our moderator, Dr. Willy Bayuardi Suwarno. Yes, the show the slide, please, Mas. Yeah. It is now my pleasure to introduce our first moderator, Dr. Willy Bayuardi Suwarno. He is an associate professor of plant breeding and biotechnology study program. He graduated from IBB University for his bachelor and master degree. Then he pursued his doctoral degree from University of Wisconsin-Madison, the USA. And currently he teaches and researches under plant breeding and biotechnology study program, graduate school, IBB University. He researched a lot in biometric in plant breeding, genetic diversity and applied breeding on maize and melon, genotype by environment interaction, and development of statistical software for stability and cluster analysis. And now he is a technical editor in Indonesian Journal of Agronomy. This first presentation session is fully moderated by Dr. Willy for approximately 140 minutes. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Willy Bayuardi Suwarno. Dr. Willy, time is yours. Thank you very much, Mbak Rahma. Um, uh, very much appreciated your um, introduction. And uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I hope uh, you're all in the good health. And it's a great honor for me to be with you in this session. Um, so um, for this session, uh, we will have 
uh, two great presenters. Um, uh, for the first presenter, uh, I would like to invite Professor Wataru Sakamoto. Um, let me uh, uh, briefly introduce him. Um, Professor Wataru Sakamoto, uh, he is a member of Plant Acclimatization uh, Research Group uh, in Institute of Plant Science and Resources, Okayama University. So, uh, thank you, Professor Wat uh, Sakamoto. Uh, we appreciate very much uh, your uh, availability uh, to give a talk in this uh, seminar. Uh, so um, uh, we can go back, uh, go back to the first slide, please. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, Professor Sakamoto, um, he got his PhD in the Graduate School of Agronomy, the University of Tokyo. Uh, and uh, he has a lot of experiences uh, as an um, uh, in research uh, in uh, mainly in Japan and also in France and also uh, he got um, a chance to uh, uh, to do his postdoctoral in Cornell University in USA. Uh, so and he wrote a lot of publications. Uh, uh, I read that uh, it's been uh, 135 uh, publication or more. Uh, and then uh, we can uh, go to the next slide to see uh, some of his um, uh, uh, academic activities. Uh, and also uh, he is now uh, 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 editorial board members uh, in plant and cell uh, physiology and also uh, uh, also in uh, 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 has a postdoctoral uh, some experiences uh, in uh, postdoctoral fellowship and also a honorary professor in Shanghai Normal University. So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor Sakamoto to deliver his uh, presentation. Um, uh, uh, time is yours. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, um, um, thank you, Vidi, uh, for your kind introduction. And, and also, all of you uh, are coming here to just to listen to my talk. Uh, although this is online, I, I really now feel like I'm in Indonesia, <laughs> looking at uh, all of your faces. But anyway, um, it is a good opportunity to, to give my talk here. Uh, and then maybe I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the works in, in Sorghum. And uh, can I share my screen? Does it look okay? Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's very good. Yeah. Right. Okay. So um, thank you anyway. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the work going on in my laboratory about the sorghum. So a crop of African origin, I say, with a cutting edge genome technology. And uh, my name is Wataru Sakamoto from uh, Institute of Plant Science and Resources at Okayama University. Uh, I will spend uh, just a few minutes to introduce myself and my institution. Uh, institute is called IPSR, as I mentioned. And uh, this institution has been established by the uh, local philanthropist called Mago Saburo Ohara about uh, 100 years ago. So the uh, institute has more than 100 year history. And then it is located in a small lovely town called Kurashiki in Okayama Prefecture, which is the Western part of Japan. Because of this situation that uh, it was created by Mangosaburo Ohara, the campus is uh, remote from the main campus of Okayama University, but it's a lovely town. So if you're interested, maybe you can visit and come. Our institute is working on the uh, plant stress science, meaning that uh, we just do more or less like uh, basic research, understanding some of the uh, plants uh, coping against uh, plant abiotic and biotic stresses. Uh, so like a pathogen or insects, those are the biotic uh, you know, stress, and then how those plants 
uh, interact with the plant, you know, uh, the insect or pathogens, because the plant is just, you know, stands there with, with the roots and then they cannot move from the harsh environments. So they really have to have a systems to, 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 you know, fight against those stresses. And in my laboratory, uh, particularly, uh, we are uh, uh, focusing on the light stress. So my group is called the light, uh, uh, plant light acclimation research group. So our group studies various aspects of chloroplast development and photosynthesis uh, through understanding of the factors involved in photoprotection and chloroplast function. We aim at improving. Uh, we aim at improving crop productivity against atmospheric stress over the long term. What this means is that. Uh, Anyway, we work on the basic side of the research, uh, understanding chloroplast biogenesis and photosynthesis, which is important for, let's say, biomass. But uh, we want to carry this knowledge to the developing some of the you know, uh, future crops. So uh, we are in between like uh, basic and uh, practical researches. Uh, for example, this is one example about uh, a protein called VIPP1, which is a critical factor for the thyroid formation. And some of the students are actually working on this project. And uh, some of the works published from our laboratory can be uh, seen in, in, in such kind of uh, journals so that uh, we just try to publish uh, you know, what we, what we um, did in, in the laboratory. Just a more a couple of advertisement. So that, as I mentioned, I'm a faculty member in the institute, and, and I have a Twitter account here. So maybe if you're interested, we can follow uh, my account. I also have an account as uh, editor in chief of the journal called Plant and Cell Physiology. This journal is a top one of the top journals in plant science, and it it is published by uh, Japanese Society of Plant Physiologists since uh, 1959. So it has uh, more than 60 years of history, and uh, now it is published with partnership from uh, Oxford University Press. So just an advertisement. So if you're interested, follow this tweet account. All right, uh, another, another advertisement is that uh, I have uh, uh, several uh, YouTube, uh, YouTube videos where uh, I introduce my laboratory as a laboratory of plant genetics and physiology. And uh, there is other video that uh, I visited. I gave a talk uh, last month in, in Kenya uh, with the anniversary of uh, Kenya-Japan partnership for 60 years. There are many 60 years, but anyway. Um, so uh, uh, if you're interested, maybe you can look at this video. Uh, the topic is more or less uh, similar to what I'm gonna talk today, right? Um, is it okay? So now we go into um, uh, science. How long do I have for my talk? Would it be okay that I, I talk like a 40 minutes? Sure, sure. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Right, so uh, I'll be spending uh, uh, the rest of the time for the introduction of our work in sorghum. So the, uh, but uh, first of all, I like, I always like to have some kind of a brief introduction of, about the crop improvement. Uh, just the context of crop improvement in the past and future. And uh, the keyword is a high yield with a low input. Uh, for the rest of the time, I will talk about our work in sorghum. First one is a sorghum QTL mapping uh, using a particular Japanese land race called Takakibi. Sorghum is called Takakibi in Japan, Japanese, so that uh, we just used uh, one local line to create the uh, genetic material to perform QTL analysis. Keyword is a uh, recombinant inlet line, and we did uh, genotyping by sequencing called the GBS. Then for the two of the topics here, uh, I will be talking about the particular uh, gene hunting. So the isolation of the gene controlling cadmium accumulation. Cadmium is a toxic element and then we want to avoid it, particularly in the sorghum grains. And then we found that the uh, key gene controlling this cadmium accumulation. So I'm gonna be talking about this. Uh, so the keyword is uh, what we call the ionomic, ionome analysis and the cadmium transporter, HMA3. 
And finally, uh, there is other gene we identified recently that controls own formation. Are you familiar with the own? Own is a needle-like structure on the on the lemna, so that uh, rice has some owns, like uh, you know, it, it may act as uh, you know a protecting grains uh, against the birds or some animal attacks, for example. But uh, we uh, now found a very important gene controlling uh, this own formation in sorghum. So if I have extra time, maybe I'll talk about this as well. Right. So just a part of uh, uh, introduction, uh, crop improvement, past and future. Uh, when you consider about the crop uh, improvement or new crops, what would you think? Crop was, uh, crop was developed from the wild type species without knowing any kind of science. What people did is just you know, start to uh, grow some plants after cultivation and then try to get better one just by selecting, 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 long, long time. As a result of this, uh, the wild type looking plant becomes a sort of crop which has you know, better grains or more yield. So this process is actually called domestication. Domestication is a process it's similar to uh, crop breeding, but uh, it takes just so long time. And it's been said that uh, uh, the domestication, uh, uh, you know, this, this crop, crop system uh, originated about 10,000 years ago, along with the you know, appearance of human being. Okay. So what I want to say here is that uh, we didn't know anything about the science, but we just selected better ones and then now eat, eat. But uh, it was, uh, say, last century, 20th century, where, where we understand, you know, how human being just developed and then how we adapt to environments. Uh, you know, thankful to uh, Darwin, Charles Darwin, and also a genetic, you know, concept by Gregor Mendel. We now know that something behind this, you know, domestication or selecting, uh, you know, crops. So now we can do scientific breeding program but it was only initiated like 100 years ago. So we only have 100 years of history about this plant breeding program based on the genetic knowledge, right? So you should keep it in mind anyway. And during that time, we developed, for example, hybrid seed. Hybrid seed is very important for like a hybrid bigger or controlling seed quality in the seed companies. But anyway, this knowledge comes from some kind of knowledge in breeding, scientific breeding. And uh, the major outcome of this, you know, uh, our knowledge is uh, a green revolution in the 20th centuries. Uh, uh, most of you are familiar with the green revolution? Uh, probably, yes, uh, I hope. So green revolution is uh, something like uh, this one. So the Norman Bolo, the famous breeder, uh, developed a new variety, which have a sem semi-dwarf phenotype showing something like this. So the dwarf prevents plant from uh, you know, lodging problems so that the yield was strikingly increased during the 20th century, like a two or three times increase. And that's how it's called the uh, green revolution. So this uh, IR8 uh, made by uh, IRI uh, Institute in Philippines is called uh, miracle rice. And it increased the yield actually, like here. But if you look at this x axis, the fact is that you, to, to gain this uh, yield or high yield in IR8, you really have to uh, supplement the field with the fertilizers. Okay. If it doesn't, then it just like the same as the original variety. So this created some kind of a uh, uh, I said that this is shadow of green revolution. So the concomitant requirement of fertilizer was achieved by so-called Haber-Bosch process, which made industry ammonia production, ammonia production in the 20th century. So we were able to make uh, fati uh, nitrogen fertilizers from the uh, nit uh, atmospheric nitrogens in the air. 
So what happened as a result of green revolution is like uh, industry controlled agriculture, uh, over abundance of nutrients in environments and uh, imbalanced distribution of wealth and so on had arisen in the 20th centuries. So <coughs> what I want to say is that uh, green revolution had a sort of shadow by creating some kind of conflicts as shown here, right? That's why we have to think something different for the future uh, green revolution in the 21st century. <laughs> so the idea comes from something like this. So now we call it the green revolution varieties like IR8. Uh, the past one is a high yield and a high input, right? So we, we made uh, this uh, semi-dwarf lines for a high yield. It is true, but uh, only if you have more input here. But uh, probably for the 21st century, maybe this is not useful. So what we need is uh, high yield green revolution varieties and uh, low light input <clears throat> so that the high nitrogen use efficiency is required for the future production of the, the crops. So uh, you know we need to make new varieties that make high yield under limited nutrients. So those are the things, you know, if you consider, you know, you know, uh, uh, crop improvement in the future, and perhaps this is better that you, you should keep in mind. So this is a kind of textbook uh, comments. Anyway, <coughs> sorry. Anyway, um, so those are the things, you know, you need to consider for the future, breeding for improved human health, so this could be one of my topics because you know if you if you eat much cadmium, this is highly toxic. So we need to have a safe food for the future, and also the breeding for drought tolerance. Right? The drought is becoming a serious problem, and then if you increase more yield, maybe you have to you know um, explore some some of the places for 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 the gaining yields, and then drought would be the, one of the targets for it. And as I mentioned, the breeding for low fertilizer is important, and that would lead to the second green revolution, hopefully. <clears throat> okay, so this is a, a kind of end of my uh, textbook style talk. And uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, now I'll talk about my own book, uh, which is a Sorghum one. Uh, here is a, a brief uh, introduction. Oops. Here is a, a brief introduction. Uh, uh, the field work uh, we did in, in, in Kakamega city in Kenya three years ago, right before the pandemic. And uh, the, the reason why I started working in sorghum was uh, almost like 15 years ago when I knew that uh, this sorghum is originated from African continent. So I thought that it's interesting to study. So uh, uh, as you can see, the distribution of wild uh, sorghum species is shown like here, showing that uh, there are variation here in this region, uh, suggesting that uh, the, actually the, this uh, are considered to be the origin of the sorghum. Uh, <clears throat> this is a sub-Saharan area in African continent. Then uh, sorghum uh, went to the south and north and then just crossed the Asian areas finally come to Japan or you know, Indonesia, you know, far to the, to the east. It's been said that uh, sorghum, I said that sorghum is called takakibi in Japan. And then takakibi appears in the history of Japan around uh, like uh, yeah, 12 centuries or something like that. So anyway, uh, you know, those uh, sorghum has spread out worldwide. Then uh, there are uh, fields uh, worldwide a field of sorghums. So sorghum is a world fifth cereal originated in Africa, and it is consumed in Africa as ugari. Uh, are you familiar with ugari? <laughs> ugari is a, what is it? Uga, ugari is like a steamed cooked, uh, uh, you know, maize or sorghum by sorghum flour. So it's just like a pancake, but it doesn't have any sugar in it. And uh, porridge is like a soup, and uh, they create beer from sorghum. And in Asia, uh, the, uh, most of the people use uh, sorghum grains as, as making alcohol, right? 
So in addition to this, broader attention has been paid as a gluten-free cereal and uh, antioxidant and uh, multi-mineral food materials. So those are the good thing. Uh, despite these potential though, uh, uh, its value is somewhat forgotten for, by farmers, I think. So this uh, 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 figure actually shows the, the field area of, of each crop here uh, uh, for uh, 60 years ago, and this is nowadays. So we simply compare the field area, and uh, those are the you know, areas which increased in 60 years. So it was quite prominent that wheat, you know, after soybean, rice, uh, beans, maize, those crops have been increasing a lot. So creating sort of like monoculture systems. In, in sharp contrast to this, and those are the decreased area uh, of the crops. And then uh, it is very, very, you know, remarkable that uh, millets and the sorghum areas are decreasing. I mean, this is sort of devastating. So I, I, I really have to say that, that this is a kind of conflict that although we have, a, we, we, you know, admit that, that there are uh, many potential for sorghum, but uh, farmers just don't like it. Maybe it's very difficult to grow and uh, there are some problems for lodging or, you know, like, uh, Eating by eaten by birds or other animals, maybe those are the things that we have to consider in the future. The other fact is that uh, as a sorghum, as, as a forgotten crop, is that uh, this is the just uh, uh, yield increase show, showing in yield increase in the last sixty years or so. So as I mentioned, as a green revolution, you see uh, you know sharp increase of yield of uh, some crops like wheat or maize in a developed country or in developing country as well, like a two times or three times increase. But if you look at uh, some of the things like a chickpea or sorghum here, you see there is no gain of, of increase as a result of green revolution or even the you know, instability of the yield in each year. So maybe some of the reasons why is, uh, you know, the reason why decreased cultivation area is just you know sorghum is left behind a green revolution. It is it is lacking you know breeding uh, programs, and also uh, this comes as a result of unstable yield over years. So probably we need to think you know we can create some varieties which shows the stable yield in each year against uh, stress or environments. Uh, from those, uh, those are the things, you know, general things, but if you consider this in a scientific uh, prospect, sorghum is quite interesting. Uh, for example, a sorghum has a relatively small genome size, 760 megabases. And uh, this is just like a, as twice as rice genome size. So it's very convenient to study in terms of genomics. And this genome reference is available from many cultivars. And uh, it shows high synteny with rice, uh, which uh, synteny means that the similarity of the gene arrangement in chromosomes. So that uh, rice genome analysis is very, very advanced. And we can transfer those knowledge directly to the sorghum chromosomes. So it's easier for us to allocate like a gene or gene contents or annotation you know, what gene does and such kind of information is very enriched in, in sorghums. And also maybe I won't go in detail too much, but uh, sorghum is like a maize, it's a C4 plant. So C4 means that uh, it uses a C4 compounds like a malate as a source of generating um, uh, carbon dioxide by uh, de uh, decarbonation. Uh, decarbonation uh, reaction so that uh, we don't need uh, to, uh, you know, the sorghum doesn't need too much uh, uh, CO2 from air. So that's why it shows a uh, high tolerance to drought. And of course it has a high biomass and probably the good material for bioenergy production, right? So sorghum has an opportunity to develop new varieties. So that's why we decided to explore sorghum important genetic factors by QTL. Uh, QTL, uh, I, I believe most of you are familiar with QTL. It's a quantitative trait loci uh, that are genomic regions associated with a particular phenotype variation. 
So we just characterize it. Uh, maybe I'll talk that later on. So the material I we chose this uh, is called the Japanese nowadays, Takakibi, and uh, the variety's name is called NOG. So uh, uh, we just simply developed the recombinant inlet line. Recombinant inlet line means uh, simply make cross with two varieties. Uh, I used the, uh, this uh, American uh, grain sorghum uh, inbred line called BTX623. Just cross it and then make F1 hybrid. And then uh, just single seed descent is made for the uh, 250 individuals. Just repeat selfing, selfing, select one seed, and then create this population. Supposedly at the F6 uh, generation, we consider that most of the gene uh, allele, each allele becomes homozygous, either derived from this side or this side. Then uh, we just you know, determine the whole genotype of this F6 population and they use as a source for uh, characterizing the phenotype. So that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, looking at some particular phenotypes between those parents, BTX623 and NOG, turned out that uh, it's very obvious that you know, those parents show different phenotypes. Originally, we were interested in this phenotype called the stay greenness. Stay green mean, just simply means uh, you know, the leaf stays green. Stay green might be a good uh, phenotype to get more uh, violence, for example. Whereas if you have an opposite phenotype, uh, let's say you know, accelerated senescence, that would mean that uh, maybe the redistribution of the nutrients goes from the leaves to the, to the other parts uh, efficiently. So that by controlling this kind of, of nutrient distribution, maybe we could uh, you know, uh, exploit um, new varieties in terms of you know, photosynthesis or, or leaf senescence. Originally, we thought this, and then obviously, NOG shows the earlier senescence phenotype. Turned out that uh, this uh, senescence phenotype is somewhat related to the pesticide resistance. We found out that uh, this Japanese Takakibi showed uh, uh, sensitivity to particular uh, pesticide called organophosphate, uh, like uh, Olutram. So we just uh, characterized it and found that uh, this uh, sensitivity is a dominant phenotype, which might be associated with the state greenness. Anyway, uh, this is one of the phenotypes we, were, uh, try, we are trying to understand. And also, in addition to this, uh, these two parents show a very robust uh, uh, different phenotypes, like uh, root architecture is clearly different. And the plant height, uh, as I said, the BTX is a dwarf line, whereas the uh, Japanese Takakibi is a more or less taller one. And uh, Panico has very di di uh, diverse, uh, you know, dispersed uh, panicles, whereas BTX has showed a concentrated one. And also uh, the spike red shows the quite difference in the phenotype. And uh, this is the own. So the BTX is ownless variety, whereas energy has a very long own. So, so those differences can be characterized if we genotype all the population in, in, in recombinant inlet lines. So, um, but the people used to say that we just use two lines and how come this can be important? But uh, uh, to answer that question, we uh, characterized about 460 accessions uh, of uh, sorghum lines we collected from all over the world. And uh, this has been done in collaboration with a group in Tokyo University. But uh, when we characterize those uh, 400 accessions, then we uh, categorize them according to the you know, difference in the, in, the, in the genotypes. Found out that uh, uh, those lines can be categorized into three groups. One in USA, Africa, Asia, and the group two is Asia. And the group three uh, represents uh, South African lines. And uh, uh, BTX actually uh, resides in the group three, whereas NOG is an Asian, Asian line. So it shows a high variation and uh, what show, what's shown here is a, a, a sort of a genetic diversity. So uh, we just asked uh, how long uh, genomic region is uh, per SNP. 
And uh, if you compare, according to the literature, if you compare something like uh, Japonica indica rice uh, comparison, then uh, you see, you find like about one KB, uh, in the one KB interval, you just find one S, S and P. Whereas uh, in our case, BTX and NOG shows like uh, less than this, suggesting that uh, more uh, diversity or variation exists between even with these two lines, something like a Japonica and Indica lines, suggesting that uh, this has a, a you know good potential to study you know genetic diversity even with these two lines, these two lines, right? So this is a summary of what we've done. So uh, we just made a cross of VTX and NOG and uh, made F2 self to F2, and then this did uh, just select the single seed for each line and establish uh, recombinant inbred lines. We performed it uh, since uh, 2012, and uh, we gained uh, this F6, F6 population um, in uh, 2014, and later on we did a field research both in Kurashiki and also in Hiroshima in collaboration with the Professor Kusaba. This is just a summary of uh, genotyping by sequencing. Uh, this is about 10 years ago. So the sequencing was, uh, was still uh, expensive, but now probably you can do whole sequencing for each line. But at the time when we did it, we just did this uh, called uh, rat sec analysis. So we uh, just uh, digested uh, genomic DNA with the two kinds of restriction enzymes, uh, six base cut and four base cut, and then just you know uh, uh, fragment them. And then at each end, we just have adapters and then try to read each sequencing. So um, uh, this is, to save some cost anyway, but we were able to sequence genotype all the six, uh, sorry, 250 lines. So this is a result of a genetic map we created. As a result, we created uh, about a little less than 4,000 markers uh, within the, this you know, 700 megabase uh, 10 chromosome regions. So we thought that uh, one marker per uh, 658 KB should be sufficient to pinpoint some of the important genes when we get QTLs, okay? So originally we did uh, this by RADSEC, but uh, maybe whole genome sequence would be now available depending on the uh, money you have. But, uh, okay, so this is the source of material for QTL analysis in terms of genotyping. And uh, so now we got a genotyping by RADSEC. So whatever you do for phenotyping, and then we can, you know, uh, link it to, 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 the, to the genes. So what we do is a QTL analysis, and we use the R QTL, QTL program and perform the uh, QTL interval mapping, okay? So just look at yield or second metabolites or whatever. You just measure it in a 250 uh, individual population, and then, uh, you know, uh, associated it with the QTL. So uh, we did a, a extensive collaboration with people in Tokyo University and Hiroshima University so that uh, uh, this, this made it uh, uh, quickly. Uh, Japanese people don't move such, such a quick, such quickly. Uh, this is very fast moving. But anyway, we, uh, uh, we generate a system by which uh, we use like a barcoding to, to just measure it simply. And uh, that's what uh, people do here. And also we were interested in a panic or dissection. So we just uh, align them carefully and then take photographs. We also did, did, did a sort of imaging analysis. So we collect all the leaves and then align them together with the color difference and then take photographs and then uh, did sort of like AI analysis for measuring the leaf area or greenness by this digital analysis. So uh, uh, as a whole result, uh, we were able to get a quite interesting result. Uh, so like uh, um, many, many QTLs appear. So uh, the, the, the results showing here is, uh, is somewhat boring, but uh, maybe you can take, a, we can take a look at. The first one here is, is uh, showing the QTLs 
uh, dazed hitting. Okay, dazed hitting means the time for hitting, uh, flooding. And the flooding sometimes uh, is a very important when you consider the, 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 the biomass, because if you, uh, generally speaking, if you have a late flooding phenotype, then the biomass is high, okay? So in our population, we found, you know, several um, QTLs. Uh, QTL is abbreviated something like this. Uh, Q means QTL. And uh, HD means you know heading time, and the different color represents different year and a different location. So this one is a classic in 2017. So uh, for example, this uh, QTL in chromosome eight represents uh, reproducible uh, QTLs detected in different year and different locations. That means that maybe this is a convincing phenotype and we can study it later. There are some minor uh, QTLs for headings, but uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, you know, crops have so many genes controlling headings. So this could be one of them controlling uh, just between BTX and NOG. Uh, looking at the plant height, uh, we found that uh, there are two very, very prominent QTLs on chromosome seven and chromosome nine. Turned out that uh, those uh, uh, genes have been already reported in Solam, and uh, this one corresponds to so-called uh, dwarf three, DW3, and then this is DW1. And uh, if you look at the shoot weight, so it's more like a biomass, then uh, we found that uh, there are two major QTLs found in chromosome seven and nine. If you compare this one together with the plant height, it is quite similar. So we cannot conclude it, but the strong assumption is that uh, plant height probably most likely controls uh, biomass as well. And uh, this is an interesting QTL. This is a brick, bricks. And we found a quite a novel QTL here on chromosome seven. So this is a, a, a maybe I'll show some of the examples. Uh, this is a days to heading. Uh, this is the outer curve of QTL analysis. And then here the number shows the chromosome. And this is a lot square. A lot of square is, is a likelihood of you know, the, 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 the QTL uh, that, that, you know, uh, is, is, is located at, at, uh, at the position shown here. So uh, for heading, and uh, we did it uh, multiple times in Hiroshima, and then we did the uh, uh, you know, reproducible one in chromosome eight. And uh, for plant height, uh, as I mentioned, we had a very sharp uh, QTL on chromosome seven and chromosome nine. And it uh, turned out, that uh, as mentioned, um, this shows that uh, NOG type uh, shows the higher uh, uh, plant, uh, longer stem. And uh, probably this represents that, uh, actually this gene is, is uh, uh, dominant for, for NOG. Found out that if you look at the genomic sequence, we also have a resequence data of NOG. And a comparison shows that uh, BTX has some mutation here, so that uh, BTX DW1 gene is, is uh, non-functional, whereas NOG is a functional gene. Also for DW3, we see that uh, uh, the functional uh, uh, DW3 gene uh, lies in NOG, whereas uh, uh, gene some kind of uh, uh, DNA duplication occurred in, in DW, uh, BTX623, showing that this is non-functional one. So those two uh, dwarf genes may be the major factors, at least for these two parents. Uh, what I wanted to tell here is that uh, uh, by doing this QTL analysis, now we can go down to the actual gene and what what it you know what's wrong with these genes by our population uh, this is the one for biomass total weight and then you know those two peaks might represent plant height genes as well okay 
So uh, this is a sort of a, a summary. So this population now allows us to, to hunt novel genes for many other important traits. So as we do QTLs and we can find some new genes controlling many agronomical traits, right? So um, I think for the rest of the time, now go to the uh, first part of uh, gene hunting, which is a sorghum grain devoid of uh, cadmium accumulation. So it's called the uh, uh, ionome analysis. So um, um, this is a general introduction about element transport. Okay, so for growing plants, there are essential mineral elements. Optimum uh, crop productivity requires a balanced homeostasis of essential materials and the sequestration of toxic elements. So the plant needs to incorporate essential mineral elements like iron, you know, zinc, um, copper, many others. But uh, you know, if there is no uh, uh, minerals which not are not used for plants, and they have to sequester it, and uh, uh, typical one is like arsenic and uh, cadmium. So this often requires the recruitment of metal transporters. Widely studied in rice and Arabidopsis thaliana. So what this means is that the most of the study has focused on the transporter localized in the membrane, which allows the metal uh, pass across the membranes and incorporate it or just export it. Okay. So those knowledge has been very much accumulated in the recent works, and the identification of these transporters occasionally employs ionomics combined with the genetic analysis. So for example, uh, for ion, uh, it's been known that uh, there are many transporters are involved in, uh, in uh, you know, distribution of, of uh, minerals. So first of all, you need to acquire it from the soil and then distribute it to the root and upper tissue and finally to the, to the grains. So for, the, for, the, for each part, it's been known that uh, such kind of transporters are required and for zinc as well. And also for that toxic element, cadmium, it's been known that uh, probably um, cadmium had been incorporate, incorporated uh, accidentally along with the you know, other transporters, which would you know, uh, incorporate other divalent cations. <laughs> but anyway, uh, those are known uh, uh, transporters, but the study of metal transporters in seas of sorghum and other C4 crops remain largely unexplored. So it's a good chance that we perform ionome analysis and then see if there is any QTLs for the particular uh, minerals. That's what exactly we did. So the quantification of the total element composition, ionome, an organism for the discovery of genes and gene networks controlling it. So simply we took uh, grains from real population and measure it. Uh, just just few grains, and then uh, digest it with the nitric acid in a heating block, and then uh, just uh, uh, you know set it for uh, um, ICP mass analysis. In our uh, pipeline, we are able to identify twenty two elements for each sample, and then perform QTR analysis for those uh, uh, accumulation of uh, mineral elements in grains. So this is a summary of the result of the parents. So first of all, we look at uh, those 22 elements accumulation uh, in, in, uh, in BTX and uh, NOG. So there are some difference, but uh, not too much. But uh, uh, anyway, we can do QTR analysis in the population, but uh, please look at this one. Cadmium was quite uh, clear in difference. So that uh, BTX623 tends to accumulate more uh, cadmium, but the uh, NOG is, is most like, you know, mostly uh, devoid of cadmium accumulation in grains. And then this was also true in the, in, 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 uh, in the next years. So we thought that cadmium would be the very specific one and decided to focus on it. 
this is the summary of our data showing that many, many uh, uh, you know, QTLs can be identified. Uh, like uh, we have here color code where we show the different uh, minerals and the QTLs distributed in each 10, you know, 10 chromosomes. Um, so what we can say from this is that, uh, uh, for example, some of the QTLs overlaps with the different elements like uh, here S and SE, suggesting that the overlapping and clustered QTL may also support the idea that the shared genetic network is, exists among these elements. In contrast, uh, this was the very prominent one, uh, is specific to cadmium, so that it had the highest load score and then explained high phenotypic variation. So maybe this is a good candidate to characterize it at the gene level. So we decided to do that. Uh, before going in detail about this, this gene analysis, maybe uh, I just summarize how cadmium is, is affecting uh, plants and humans. So cadmium is readily taken up by plants and does not form a volatile organic species and thus can accumulate in crops causing plant growth inhibition. And plants have therefore evolved a mechanism that protect them from uh, cadmium stress. Uh, there are four ways to uh, avoid this cadmium stress known. One is uh, just the binding cadmium to the cell wall. Second one is a sequestration of the cadmium if it comes and then just sequester it into the vacuole. So, so this sequestration works quite well. And uh, development of metal binding ligands, uh, you know, then they toxify that you know, compound or simply, you know, if lax from the cell. So those are the kind of things that, that uh, plants just uh, 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 fight against. And uh, in, in plants, it's been known that uh, there are this type of heavy, heavy metal ATPases called H HMA, which are involved in heavy metal homeostasis and divided into two based on their uh, metal trans uh, substrate specificity. Sometimes it's, it's called a zinc, cobalt, uh, cadmium, and, and uh, uh, lead um, transporting or copper or, 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 or silver. But uh, uh, <clears throat> in, in rice, uh, nine HMAs are known and sorghum has 11. So it could be that the QTL we found might correspond to one of these. Uh, in case of human consumption of cadmiums, uh, of course, uh, people know that uh, biological half-life of cadmium in the body is nearly 30 years. So that if you have cadmium in your body, and that leads to the chronic toxicity into many organs like you know, listed here. And this cadmium toxicity comes mostly from uh, cereals. Um, cereals, and then cereals cadmium uh, accumulation comes from say contaminated water or soil, or the, you know, those are, uh, those are, uh, consumption of those contaminated uh, materials by animals and then finally just goes to this by the you know uh, uh, consumption by humans so the genetic characterization of genes controlling cadmium accumulation is very important for breeding plants that do not accumulate cadmium in edible plant part so um right okay um Right, so um, um, cadmium accumulation in Rengren has been shown to be strongly influenced by root and shoot transportation. The other factors we should keep in mind is that uh, even for this PTX and NOG case, if we uh, calculate, uh, if we measure the uh, cadmium content in shoot and root, what happens is that the PTX tends to accumulate more cadmium in the shoot part and not root part, whereas uh, NOG is, is more like opposite. So if we see the translocation factor showing that uh, how much cadmium is translocated in the shoot part, it's quite high in BTX and lower in NOG, showing that uh, probably uh, this low cadmium content in NOG seed comes from the sequestration of cadmium in the root tissue. 
And uh, uh, finally, we made a, a QTL analysis. And uh, as, as shown here, uh, uh, the lot score is quite high and a sharp QTL, a major QTL was detected here. And uh, for this marker region, and we were not, we were able to narrow down the chromosome region within uh, 156 KB. Uh, there are 17 genes in there, and then found that uh, there are two genes associated with this cadmium transport, annotated as a cadmium zinc transporting ADPases. Actually, this was uh, in a previous publication, although they didn't characterize it. They named it HMA3 A and B. According to our analysis, it turned out that it's most likely that the causative gene is this HMA3 A because this 3B might be a pseudogene. But anyway, to make a long story short, um, <laughs> this one is the one I talked about. So the HMA3 A is the gene, right? Then uh, it was annotated like this one in the database. Then we, we tried to compare it with the NOG. So we tried to find the difference between these two genes in, in two parents, but found out that uh, actually annotation was wrong. It took my student uh, more than one year to figure this out. But uh, uh, finally, she was able to found that uh, BTX annotated as HMA3A is mutated due to the uh, uh, improper uh, splicing of, of uh, this cDNA. So the prediction of this splicing was, was not correct. And actually the splicing occurred like five base pair, uh, more five prime to the uh, first exon. Mm -hmm. Turned out that uh, this BTX is a non-functional gene. Whereas NOG had a functional gene like this one. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So NOG, but not BTX 6 23 has a functional HMA3. So we did a, a more analysis showing that uh, I just maybe I should skip this one, but uh, briefly mentioning that uh, um, um, uh, BTX. Um, grain uh, cadmium content is, is high. Uh, sorry, uh, BTX uh, cadmium content is high, energy is low. When we compare F2 seed population for the cadmium content, F2, all F2 shows the low cadmium content, meaning that the low cadmium content is a dominant over uh, this high cadmium accumulation. So what this suggests is that the NOG type is a dominant um, gene. And this supports, uh, partly supports this because uh, this is the functional gene. So the NOG type is a dominant. To support this function, we did a complementation analysis in, in the East system. So I, I think I will, I should skip this one because of the time, but uh, now we confirm that uh, NOG HMA3A transporter is active, okay? And finally, uh, we show that uh, this is a typical analysis that we do. So we express this uh, HMA3 with a GFP at the C-terminal fusion and then see how it is localized. And uh, we show that uh, this HMA3A appeared to be localized in, in a vacuole, okay? So the sequestration system could be the number two of the original cartoon I showed you. So the uh, sort of a model, uh, model explaining what happens in, in uh, this NOG and BTX system is that uh, here you have solgam. Um, and uh, this is the situation in NOG. So that NOG has the functional SPHMA3A, which is localized in, in the vacuole. And the vacuole HMA3A incorporates cadmiums. So as a result of this sequestration, uh, cadmium accumulates more in the root tissue. And then, you know, xylem loading of uh, cadmium is less so that uh, it doesn't reach uh, shoots or grains. And uh, this could create uh, 
sort of uh, very safe uh, grains for consumption. In contrast, um, uh, BTX623 has a non-functional HMA3A so that uh, you know, this sequest sequestration doesn't take place. So that the cadmium is loaded on the xylem toward the upper tissue and uh, shoot and uh, you know, all area accumulates more cadmium. So this is not good, of course, for the consumption. But if you consider that uh, uh, sorghum is a very, very high biomass, so this uh, plant, NOG, uh, sorry, BTX, might be a good source for uh, like a fight remediation. So that it's a good opportunity that you can sucking up many, many cadmiums in a contaminated area. So this is a kind of a, a mirror of the genes, but uh, maybe we can exploit it in the future for developing uh, like a safer uh, a variety or a variety for the fight remediation, right? Um, do I have more time? Yes, you have uh, uh, five more minutes, uh, <laughs> Professor. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let me go through with the uh, briefly go through with the final one. It's a gene controlling the own formation. So the identification of a dominant own inhibitor. It's called a dye gene. Okay. As I mentioned, uh, uh, own is a needle like structure on top of the lemna. Uh, here, so you can obviously see these, you know, ohms. So um, uh, this ohm uh, is uh, quite variable in the sorghum uh, varieties or accessions, and you can see, in addition to these uh, uh, morphologies of the, the the panicles, you see uh, such kind of ohm structure. But interestingly, um, typically we see, you know, complete loss of ohm or just the ohm. Uh, you know, uh, varieties. So we simply decided to characterize it, but uh, what, what is it then? What, what is it doing, you know, for the plants? Why do we need to have this own structure in cereals? Uh, people uh, used to, you know, try to understand it for a long time. And uh, um, I'm not sure if this is a really the answer for it, but uh, generally speaking, uh, the own does something for the seed, you know, disperse. And uh, this result shows that in case of some wild wheat species, uh, the own tends to bend according to the moisture. And then this uh, change in the, in the bend would see the different, um, different, um, na, 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 <laughs> different, different uh, uh, going into the soil, <laughs> depending on this, this uh, angle, okay? So the, all may have some kind of adaptation to the difference in the environment. Depending on that, then they, they change the, the way to go into the soil. So this is one way for the own to be present in, 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 in the uh, cereal seas. But the other fact, which is more clear for us is that uh, you know, presence of own simply avoid you know, uh, the birds uh, coming to, to, the, to the grain or panicles. So as shown this, uh, you know, sparrows are just, uh, you know, serious enemies for, for sorghum cultivation, but uh, maybe the own is better to be, you know, on the grains. But uh, on the other hand, um, you know, this is, although this is important in wild species, own in cereal crops often disturb more than agriculture by hindering manual harvesting. And also this is not good for the, for the uh, animal consumption, for the digestion. So people tend to uh, develop own less uh, varieties for sorghum, for example. So we simply did this uh, with the NOG and BTX. NOG has all uh, owns and BTX does not. Simply measured it and did a QTR analysis. And surprisingly, uh, this lot score was over 100. So. Um, this is my personal think. I personally think this is a world record of Lotto score. <laughs> but anyway, uh, it shows that uh, there is a striking element controlling the presence or absence of all. Okay. To make long story short, um, uh, just let me conclude that uh, we were able to identify that gene, uh, this dye gene, to be this one. Uh, it's called. Uh, turned out that it's a sort of a novel uh, protein. 
uh, containing a, a log domain. So it's most likely that it's, it is acting as a transcription factors. And actually, if you if you introduce this gene into the this this own owned lines, and then we just make it disappear, uh, showing that uh, this gene is the, the required for 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 this you know own presence. Um, let me skip this part. But uh, what was really interesting is that this is a sort of functional analysis to 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 you know conclude that uh, uh, this gene is involved in uh, own this phenotype. It's acting in a dominant way to diminish own. What we found is that actually this di gene is uh, has a sister gene in the chromosome ten. Uh, amino acid sequence is hundred percent same. So its duplicated gene appeared in chromosome three in Solan. What we looked at this this sister gene. This sister gene existed in the synthetic region of the other cereals like uh, uh, rice, brachypodium, uh, maize, suggesting that this gene is the origin. But somehow this gene is jumped into the other chromosome region of chromosome three and uh, uh, gained this function of, as an ownless phenotype. <coughs> Sorry, so what we think now is something like this. So uh, originally we had a di original gene in chromosome 10, with, whose function is known, but somehow related to you know, panicle formation. But anyway, this uh, di gene was jumping into chromosome three region, where uh, this pink color shows the uh, you know, different pattern of expression, particularly for the own areas. And then how, this is how uh, this gene controlling di uh, own formation in solums. Uh, more interestingly, um, we found that, uh, uh, so we simply thought it's interesting that this dye, you know, inhibition might work in the other species. So we introduced this dye, sorghum dye gene in rice. And then actually this is the result so that uh, we could make this, uh, you know, uh, rice uh, owns disappear by introducing the sorghum genes. So uh, maybe this uh, di gene is very important to you know, just control or you know make it uh, disappear or just control it by genome editing or this kind of analysis, right? So I think I talked too much. I'm sorry, <laughs> uh, but uh, I just uh, summarize what, what I've talked. So the sorghum has a potential crop is a potential crop for, for our life. And we exploited Japanese Takakibi NOG and high density genetic map. Uh, I showed uh, some of the example, you know, you know, novel genes and functional studies, uh, including HMA3A for cadmium transport and uh, dominant own inhibitor for the formation of own. We also have uh, some other works on uh, organophosphate pesticide sensitivity. So that if you're interested, if you can you can follow to this uh, previous publication. Um, all right, so uh, sorry for taking so much time. So this work has been done in collaboration with a uh, group in Tokyo University head by uh, Nobuhiro Tsutsumi. And uh, also uh, Kusaba Makoto helped us to do field study in Hiroshima University. And uh, this uh, HMS, HMA3A work has been done by former student Fiona Masira Wahinya from Kenya. And uh, uh, QTL analysis has been mostly done by uh, Hiromi Kajia Kanegae. And uh, Hideki Takanashi did most of the work in a Dai uh, own uh, story. Right. With that, uh, I, I think I close my, my talk and uh, welcome to have some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sakamoto, for a super interesting presentation. And uh, I understand there are. Uh, several questions uh, from the audience, but um, before we uh, go on to the uh, discussion section, um, let me uh, invite the uh, second great presenters. Um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, Dr. Sahid will uh, present uh, the CV of uh, Dr. Ning. Yeah. So Dr. Trikusumaning Tias, 
she is a member of the plant breeding and biotechnology uh, study program uh, a member uh, also a member of the division of genetics in plant breeding in the department of agronomy and horticulture uh, she has a lot of experience in um, breeding of field crops especially sorghum uh, also uh, uh, several other crops uh, rice and also uh, wheat um, uh, she has um, uh, a lot of um, experience also in uh, breeding crops for adaptation to abiotic stress environment and there are several um, uh, publications uh, many publication um, on uh, breeding uh, food crops uh, mainly uh, in sorghum and also uh, related to um, uh, uh, some other important crops. Um, so without further ado, uh, let me invite Dr. Ning uh, to deliver her presentation. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Willy, for the very nice introductions. Um, I will uh, present my presentations. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I will try to share my presentations. So, uh, is it uh, visible? Can you see my presentation? Yes. Oh, really? Uh, uh, yes. But uh, uh, could you please, yeah, make it, yeah, it, yeah, it's already a uh, slideshow. Okay. Uh, Okay, so good morning, everybody. Uh, it is a very good opportunity for me to uh, share with you our experience in sorghum breedings. Um, the topics that was asked of Dr. Uh, Professor Dewi asked me is to note from sorghum breeding to improve efficiency. So uh, I will start. Sorghum as a uh, mentioned before by Professor Sakamoto is uh, a multi-purpose crop. It could be used as grain as uh, many of us um, have been introduced to uh, sorghum rice lately. And it also can be uh, made into flour, so it can be made into gluten-free food. But also sorghum has a, a produced stem juice in uh, what we call nira that can be used into uh, sorghum sugar or uh, uh, ferment, uh, fermentation of the sugar can be made into bioethanol. What we are working uh, late, uh, lately, this is that sorghum has um, high biomass that could and stay green that can be used for uh, feeder, for feed, uh, cattle feed. And also uh, because it has some of the sorghum variety has high lignin content, it can be made into biomaterials. And we are working uh, at the moment to produce sorghum for solid bioenergy as sorghum pellet. Uh, sorghum also has other additional uh, advantages because it's uh, efficient in the use of water and nutrients. And um, some of our study shows that um, it uh, uses less phosphorus uh, than uh, some varieties uh, have efficient uh, phosphorus utilization. And also sorghum can be made into perennial uh, grain crops because it produces ratun crops. After you uh, harvest it, it can, it can regrow and uh, you can harvest um, multiple times. So our uh, work in sorghum breeding uh, in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture uh, started in 2007 and up to 2018, we are working mostly for adaptation to acid soils. We studies, uh, we uh, did a lot of experiments and selection in acid soils. Also, we studied a lot with nutrient use efficiency, uh, specifically phosphorus uh, efficient use, uh, nutrient use efficiency in acid soils. We also st uh, studies about stay green uh, for biomass. 
and high yielding perennial crop using uh, studies on the ratun uh, capability and uh, productivity of some sorghum uh, varieties. We uh, registered three uh, varieties uh, that are adapted to acid soil and have good nutrient use efficiency, named IPB Soraya 1, 2, and 3. From uh, 2019 to present, we work with uh, improving grain quality in addition to high productivity. Uh, currently, we have 10 high yielding sorghum elite lines that have been uh, going through uh, multi-locational trials and characterization and already registered. Two of them, uh, we name IPB Sorais Puti, which is a white uh, sorghum, and IPB Sorais Mera, which is a red sorghum. These uh, two uh, varieties have good adaptation to acid soils, uh, have high productivity, it's moderate tolerance to rust uh, disease, and have uh, good stay green leaves uh, for food, uh, cattle feeding. And also uh, it has good uh, return ability and productivity for multiple harvest. So this has been launched by our rectors uh, last year. Okay, so I would like to share with you some of the approaches that we done uh, during our breeding program. Uh, this is based on our experience and how to improve efficiency. Why it is important to improve efficiency is because as a, a breeder that work in a university, we have limited resources, specifically land, labor. And uh, so uh, we have to be very prudent uh, and uh, find approaches that will help us to um, improve our efficiency. So there are, uh, today I will share with you four approaches that we've uh, uh, used. First is what we call early generation testing and then rapid generation advance, fast and accurate phenotyping for segregating population because we manage a lot of segregating population. We need uh, a vast uh, phenotyping uh, during selections. And also uh, sometimes we, late, lately uh, at least we, uh, find that some of characters that we need are not available with our breeding uh, materials. So we have to go uh, beyond and search for um, wider genetic resources using pre breeding activity. So the first one that I would like to share with you is what we call early generation testing. This is, uh, we use this because we made a lot of crossing. Uh, we don't make just one or two crossings. Sometimes you make six, 11 crossings. So we have many number of populations. So this uh, method is an efficient uh, method to manage large number of segregating populations. Why? Because we have to make an early predictions of the genetic worth of these populations. Uh, we cannot continue, for example, we have 11 population. We cannot continue all of them because of the limited resources. So we have to select one or two population that have good genetic worth that uh, can be uh, continue on to advanced generations. Uh, and also by uh, making early generation testing, what we do, we can identify individuals that are superiors that we can then a select as uh, making into F2 derived lines and then continue on with a limited number but very superior genotypes. Uh, we can do that using a smaller plots uh, and a, what we call pseudo replicates. Why we call pseudo replicates is because we cannot replicate F2 because they are distinct uh, individuals. The genotypes are different from each other, but we just make into what we call pseudo replicate. So we, we make replications and then we um, evaluate different population. For example, this we have three or four or something population. So we make uh, replicates 
And then we evaluate this population based on its variability, genetic variability, and the performance of this um, uh, populations, the segregating uh, genotypes, and also early detection of disease resistance. This is important because we have very bad experience that we advance a very good uh, line and a very good uh, variety, Soraya varieties that we cannot release because uh, at the time when we want to release the ministry, uh, release a new uh, regulations for disease resistance. So we cannot release the varieties. So from there on, we would like to, de uh, we, we did all this uh, disease resistance evaluation early on in the F2 generation. Then we can select, uh, we can make, uh, select some of the, pop the population that we want and then plant it as advanced line. So um, uh, from one of this pro uh, program, we have four, uh, for example, we have four uh, process and then we make uh, early generations testing of this, uh, this F2 ge uh, generations. And then we select one of the population, we continue on and then evaluate in the F6 generation for biomass and grain yield. So this way we can make sure that the population we are handling is superior populations. Uh, we didn't throw away the other one, we just put them in the fridge and keep them for uh, another um, cycle of breeding program. So we can concentrate on this uh, population. We don't choose this one because apparently this one is very uh, highly susceptible to rust disease. So we also do uh, early generation testing for disease resistance. This is a very good idea to do because uh, then you can identify which population uh, have um, susceptible genes uh, by uh, growing a spreader row. This is a spreader row. A spreader row is, um, row of susceptible varieties known for uh, susceptibility to certain disease. And then we, we grow them as a natural source of inoculations. And then we grow the, the segregating population or whatever population uh, in between the, the spreader row. So this way you uh, will have inoculation, inoculated naturally your population and see which population uh, are resistant um, to the disease. This way you can select what population you're going to uh, further on to uh, next generation. So as you know, uh, conventional breeding takes a long time. Yeah, that's the main constraint of conventional breeding. Uh, the time uh, that we spend mostly is for line development. So growing from F1 to F6 or F7, where you can start uh, field trials or field testing takes five years sometimes, four to five years. So this is a problem that we would like to solve. So um, we have an approach. What we can do is to reduce the uh, line development time, uh, maybe in half, yeah, hopefully. Uh, so, uh, People usually to call them a speed breeding. Um, I, I like to call it accelerated breeding because it's not really speeding. So uh, we want to reduce the time by half. One of the approach, uh, so there are many uh, methods they can use, that you can use to, uh, for rapid generation advance. One of them is what we call accelerated single seed descent where we rapidly develop homozygous lines. And then fast generation cycling, yeah. This one is, uh, we produce more generation by stressing the plant to have shorter uh, maturity date. And with the help of in vitro culture, um, get the embryo to, for, to grow the crops. The other one is rapid generation turnover using immature seed. We have not tried the two, but we have tried this one. So I will share with you our experience with accelerated single seed descent. So single seed descent uh, 
Professor uh, Sakamoto also mentioned, I think it's it's then, this is a very efficient way to uh, attain uh, homozygosity because uh, we can, we don't do any selection. We just uh, grow single seed for, to represent its individual in the F2 generations going on to the F6 generation. And uh, this can reduce the breeding programs, the duration of the breeding program several years, uh, because you don't do a lot of the post-harvest uh, evaluation and, and characterization, which takes a long time. We just harvest, take several seeds, and then plant it for the next generation. In sorghum, it is very easy because it, uh, sorghum has no uh, dorma uh, dormation, so uh, it can grow the next season very quickly. Uh, the result of this uh, single seed descent is one plan originated from a, a different F2 plan. So you maintain the genetic diversity uh, with a small number of plants. Uh, the resulting lines is what we call the recombinant inbred lines that can be used both for breeding and molecular study as what Professor Sakamoto used for his PTL studies. So uh, we did uh, one uh, cross of Numbu and B69 to develop uh, through single seed descent. So we make a cross and then from the cross, you have uh, F2 with different uh, segregations. And then from each disc, you uh, advance the generation uh, through single seed descent. So from each uh, F2, you get a line that uh, are uh, homozygous and distinct from each other. So this is one line, uh, the, this is the F1, F5, and then we continue to F6. And uh, maybe during F6, you start uh, field trials. We do, uh, the result of this, sometimes it's not very uh, easy to do in Indonesia because uh, sorghum has a very um, low, uh, I say uh, seed viability sometimes. So well, even if we go a lot number of F2, we end up with uh, only 140 in, uh, recombinant inbred lines. So what we do with this, uh, what we did with this uh, recombinant inbred lines is we evaluate uh, this, the variability, the genetic variability, to see whether we still maintain the, the genetic variability even though the population is reduced. And we uh, showed that we have good ver uh, genetic variability. So the, we are sure that this uh, genotypes is distinct from each other. The lines is distinct from each other. So we use this, uh, the F7 uh, rails, uh, the combinant inbred lines that we developed from SSD. We tested for uh, tolerance to low uh, phosphorus conditions. So we grow them under two different environments with different level of uh, phosphorus. And we found that some lines uh, are more tolerant than the other. Uh, and uh, we find that this line, for example, the line number uh, 286 is um, more uh, efficient in phosphorus utilization than other lines. So this method, this uh, single silt descent is a good method to develop lines uh, manageable. If you have uh, small plots and uh, small areas, uh, land areas to work with, and also less labor uh, laborers than if you do uh, uh, conventional bulk method. So this is a modification of bulk method, but a more efficient way to handling the genetic material. Okay, however, uh, it still takes uh, a little bit longer. So we want to accelerate the single seed descent. So this year, uh, last year, we're starting uh, what we call accelerated single seed descent. Accelerated single seed descent is a modification of the SSD method in which we limited the vegetative growth uh, 
by imposing uh, stress, limiting the fertilizer, limiting the water, and also uh, with higher density uh, in the crowded area, we hope that the vegetative growth will be limited and induce uh, flowering early. This method has been successfully used in rice and wheat. So um, in some publication, uh, we know that it can be uh, reduced. It can grow rice for generation in one year using a very limited uh, space, a very dense populations, and also uh, low uh, fertilizer and water. And they will flower earlier. So we would like to do this in sorghum. Uh, to reduce the generation time. So we grow this in uh, high density in a, in a pot with limited water and fertilizer in a greenhouse. Uh, la last year, we found out that we were able to manage uh, to reduce the vegetative growth. However, the flowering date was not reduced significantly. So we only reduced six days. So we haven't been successful yet, but we, uh, will, we will continue this um, uh, the next season uh, during the dry period, maybe because this is still very, um, very uh, heavy rain. And so humidity is uh, high. We will try to grow during the dry season. So we'll see if it uh, reduce this, uh, the flowering date about 20 or 30 days. Okay, so in our breeding program, we um, have to do a lot of phenotypings in the field, but also some characters have to be evaluated uh, in the lab. Uh, for example, we are now developing a waxy type sorghum. And for phenotyping and a large of segregating population, we need a fast but accurate a phenotyping uh, method. So one of the uh, method that we use uh, to identify waxy type sorghum is using iodine assay uh, for pollen and grain. This is uh, one uh, method, there are other method, of course. So uh, using this uh, iodine, easy iodine, Staining is we stain the pollen and see if they turn yellow or light brown, then that is when we uh, separate from the normal dark brown. This is then identified as waxy, and this is non-waxy. What waxy sorghum is that waxy sorghum is sorghum that has low amylose content. So uh, by this method, and also we can use the grain uh, staining the endos uh, endosperm. We can separate between the waxy type. This is the magenta color is the waxy type. And this is the uh, non-waxy type, which is a uh, dark uh, blue after staining. Uh, this. Uh, by this method, we identify one uh, land race, Indonesian land race called Pulu tree as uh, waxy type sorghum. But uh, if you have this fast uh, phenotyping, you have to make sure that it doesn't give you a false negative or false positive result. So unlike a molecular uh, marker, which is more precise, this is not precise, but we have to make sure that this is accurate, which means that you tell the truth that it is what it is. So uh, you have to check and verify and calibrate uh, your uh, method before you apply to your larger populations. By doing so, you can uh, make sure that your method is accurate. Um, Although it's not precise, you don't. It doesn't tell you how much uh, amylos content, but it tells you that it has low amylos. So we verify it by uh, analysis of the uh, chemical analysis of the grain to see how much uh, the amylos content, and we found out that the one that identify as waxy 
by this iodine uh, assay has low amylase content. So that's one verification that we need to uh, verify that this method is good. But we went further and used uh, molecular markers uh, that um, they are specific markers that can identify WEXC types, which is WEXA and WEXC markers. Uh, these are known markers for uh, WEXC types. What we found is that this uh, that we identify, pollute 3, is identified as non wexy similar to the other genotypes. So we find, uh, okay, uh, what happened here? Uh, the content is low, but it, in this marker, uh, this uh, identify as non wexy So we studied further. One of our master's students, studied further and found out that yes, uh, apparently it is, uh, there is a, a difference between this pollute tree and uh, the rest because it does have the mutations at the GBSS1 gene. This gene is the one that is uh, responsible for uh, uh, amylosynthesis and there is a mutations that are different than the other uh, WEXI LL that's already known. That's why it's not uh, identified uh, by the WEXI LL uh, that's already known because it's different uh, mutation site, but still it's, it has a mutation that enable, uh, so that these genes are, able, uh, are, are, are not active or at least reduce the production of amyloid. So, this is one final uh, verification that, that this uh, is right. So the method is uh, accurate and we can use them to selection. A lot of work, but to make sure that this is accurate. This is important. We have vast, a fast method you have to verify. So uh, now we can assure that we can use this and we grow uh, three populations uh, from pool tree with different crosses. We grow them, the F2 and then F3 generation. We harvest the seed and we use the method to uh, to phenotypes and select for vexy types. And you can see here there's segregations. There's not the one that has a, a pullet type or vexy types from the pullet parents and the non vexy types from the, uh, the other uh, parents. So this is a good method that uh, improve efficiency in your breeding program. So uh, uh, this is just an, uh, one example. There are many, uh, many uh, fast phenotyping that you can use, for example, for phytic acid and uh, for zinc content and Fe content, iron content. But you, you have to make sure that you verify your method before you apply to your population. Okay, uh, this is the last one that I would like to share with you. Sometimes the characters that you want is not available in your breeding material. For example, uh, WEXI type is not available uh, in our breeding population or in the variety already released. None of the variety that has been released uh, has WEXI type sorghum. So mostly are non WEXI. Uh, also, disease resistant. Rust disease is now a requirement. Not rust disease resistance, I mean is a requirement by the ministry for variety release. But none uh, of the uh, varieties that we uh, evaluate have rust uh, resistant genes. Maybe some of them are moderate, like the one that we have, but uh, none of them are resistant. So we have to go and look um, more, and we were fortunate to get some accessions from the Agricultural Gene Bank, from the Ministry of Agriculture. We have uh, 48 uh, uh, accessions. And we do um, what we call characterizations uh, of agronomic characters, disease resistance, grain quality, mostly uh, on um, 
vexi types, and abiotic stress tolerance. So this characterization is what we call a pre-breeding activity. It has it uh, characterized the genetic resources so that we can select some of them as a working collections that we can use further in our breeding program. This will improve not only the efficiency because you already have a good uh, genes for it, a good characters that you identify, but also that uh, it hopefully will improve your genetic gain during your selection. So these are the, the accession that we have from the gene bank from different countries and also different part of Indonesia uh, that we uh, are uh, fortunate uh, to be able to characterize. We characterize for disease resistance during using field uh, experiments, using spread row, and also using specific uh, marker uh, for resistance to rust uh, and anthracnose disease in sorghum. Uh, we identify some uh, accessions to have um, the allele for resistance. However, some of them are not resistant in the field, so we, we want to know what happened. Uh, we, so we have to study further for uh, making sure that we find the, the uh, parents that has um, good resistance to these two important diseases. Uh, we also uh, studied uh, agronomic characters. One of them that we are very interested in is the maturity date. Uh, so from the, we have different classes of maturity date that we use. And from the 48, uh, uh, we select 28, and then we study the maturity date. Uh, some of them have early maturity, mostly have medium to late, but we also have very late maturity dates that are more than 85 days after planting before heading time. So we are interested in this uh, uh, genotypes because this in our study links to high biomass. As I mentioned before, we are now interested in producing a variety that has high biomass productivity for um, bioenergy. So, and then we evaluate also this for biomass productions. And we found that some have low biomass, some uh, range from uh, 300 to 400 mostly. And then some have uh, a, about 500 gram per plant, but some have much higher than 500 uh, gram per plant. So this is what we're interested in. Uh, to be used as parents in our breeding program to produce high biomass varieties. So uh, we also did uh, evaluation in uh, acid soil tolerance. Why? We, we're still working with acid soils because most of our works uh, are conducted in Sumatra, Jambi, Lampung, and also in uh, South Sumatra. This is our latest experiment in South Sumatra. We just finished this. Uh, some of them is ours, and also some of the uh, accession from the gene bank. The soil is very acid, and also, as you see, it's very bleached because of the high um, uh, rainfall. So this is the type of soil we're dealing with, and we hope that we find genotypes that are adapted to this kind of uh, condition. So. Uh, to close this uh, presentations, I would like to uh, stress that sometimes you have to do a lot of uh, homework, but to find a method that is suitable for your breeding program and also to improve your efficiency in the breeding program, to reduce time in your uh, a variety release and so that uh, you have more uh, shorter times in, uh, in your breeding program. But also what's important is to improve the genetic gain uh, of your uh, population because you select the best populations early on uh, to work um, in your breeding program. And uh, we are fortunate to work in sorghum. 
because sorghum has many uh, functions and it's uh, uh, supporting a lot of the SDGs. So we are very excited and uh, we will continue work on grain and also uh, uh, quality, improving grain quality uh, and also uh, developing high uh, biomass for solid bioenergy. And we're also still working on um, uh, some um, uh, developing uh, perennial sorghum as perennial grain. We would like to see more harvest, uh, more uh, harvest, multiple harvest times and see what reduction and what uh, uh, varieties have good uh, productivity after two or uh, three harvests. So that would be uh, to close my presentations. I would like to uh, acknowledge the support from the Ministry of Education and Culture, also uh, Dr. Refli Noor from Breen, and these are our team, uh, Dr. Desta Wirnas, Dr. Siti Maria, Professor Didi Sopandi, uh, Ms. Erin Puspitarini, and some other, uh, some graduate students. We have many graduate students and undergraduates who are working with uh, uh, our program. Thank you for your attentions. Uh, thank you, Pak Willy. Uh, I hope this uh, presentation is uh, useful for uh, developing your breeding program. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Buni, for a very inspiring presentation um, uh, from uh, uh, connectivity uh, between a uh, field uh, breeding and also um, some approach from a physiology uh, standpoint and also a molecular standpoint. Uh, thank you very much. So everyone, um, we have, uh, we are happy that we have a lot of questions. Also uh, from, uh, for Professor Sakamoto, thank you very much, uh, Prof Sakamoto. Uh, you have uh, answered uh, uh, some of the questions in the chat box. And also there are some uh, uh, several questions uh, for Buni, uh, so that uh, because of the time limitation, uh, I would like to invite uh, Prof Sakamoto and Prof Ning to to give the answer of the question in writing in the chat box, and uh, also I would like to invite uh, each one of you to deliver. Um, a uh, brief summary uh, of you of the uh, uh, of your talk yeah uh, so uh, perhaps first uh, professor sakamoto uh, could you give us a brief summary and also uh, later could you please uh, uh, answer the questions in the chat box uh, thanks very much <laughs> yes uh, thank you very um, um i I was quite surprised that I had had so many questions on the on the chat, and I, I'm still catching up. But yes. uh, it was very really interesting to know, um, you know, some sorghum breeding systems from the other speaker, and also uh, I realized that uh, many of the uh, you know many of people are interested in sorghum. So uh, I think um, if if we can you know just uh, exchange this kind of information and. Uh, Hopefully, we could deepen our understanding and also our research, you know, regarding the solar bombs. So anyway, I, I really enjoyed the talk and, and I really appreciate your invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sakamoto. Um, uh, we hope to uh, that uh, we could uh, collab collab collaborate in a near future. And then uh, perhaps uh, there are um, uh, many uh, questions from the uh, audience that uh, some of them may uh, contact you through uh, your mail address or uh, another means. So maybe uh, I hope uh, you would be happy to uh, answer uh, the response yes. uh, uh, to, to their questions. Thanks very much. Uh, and then uh, the next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Buni uh, to deliver, uh, to give the, a brief conclusion and summary uh, of the talk. Uh, please, Buni. Yeah, yeah uh, 
Thank you very much, Pawili. Uh, uh, I appreciate that uh, the opportunity to be able to also not only present, but also listen to very interesting, uh, very in-depth uh, presentation from Professor Sakamoto on Sorghum uh, uh, QTL. So um, my uh, take from this uh, presentation is that sometimes you have to uh, always improve your method uh, uh, to improve your efficiency and also to increase your uh, genetic gain. And uh, uh, please, if you have uh, uh, find a new ways, uh, you have to uh, make sure that you uh, do your homework in your uh, breeding program so that uh, you can al always improve your breeding program. And I'm, I'm very uh, fortunate to have uh, many uh, teams, young, young uh, uh, researchers and also uh, PhD students and, and, and uh, uh, master and undergrad students who are working. And I hope that more of you will be interested in sorghum uh, breeding. Thank you, Pawili. Thank you very much, Buning. And thanks again, uh, Professor Sakamoto, uh, for a very interesting talk from both of you. Uh, let's give a big hand for both the presenters. And then, um, so this uh, conclude uh, this session, and I'd like to uh, hand on the time to uh, Mbak Rahma. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Willy. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Willy, for bringing us to a very productive uh, session today. And also uh, for Sakamoto Sensei and Dr. Triku Sumaning Tias uh, for the great and interesting presentation about sorghum breeding. Okay, uh, to all of the press participants, I probably highlight before we move further to the next agenda, that this webinar is held by Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Study Program and supported by East West Seed Indonesia, Sahabat Petani Yang Paling Baik. And also Forum Pas Mahasiswa Pasca Sarjana or Forsca AGH. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, we just discussed about sorghum breeding with our first two great presenters. Now we have came to our second presentation session. The second two presentation and discussion will be moderated by our moderator, Professor Darda Effendi. Then allow me to read his short bio. Professor Darda Effendi is a senior lecturer of plant breeding and biotechnology study program. He was graduated from IPB University for his bachelor and master degree, and he pursued uh, his doctoral degree from University of Florida, the USA. Currently, he teaches and researches under Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Study Program, Graduate School, IPB University. He researches in somatic embryogenesis, genetic diversity, uh, molecular marker, Post harvest management and in vitro, in vitro conservation on the tropical fruits. This second presentation session is fully moderated by Professor Darda for approximately 140 minutes. Prof. Darda, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Mbak Rahma, for a nice introduction. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, move to the second uh, session that will be uh, with two uh, speakers. I'm sorry, some, some sounds uh, in the background. Uh, the first uh, speaker in this session is Dr. Awang Mahirijaya from Plant Biotechnology and uh, uh, Plant Biotechnology Division, Department of Agronomy and Horticulture. Uh, this is uh, the sole CP of Pak Awang. Uh, yeah, okay. The first one, Pawang is a graduate uh, from BS and Master from Department of Agronomy, IPB University, and then graduate from uh, School of uh, Experimental Plant Science uh, in Wageningen University for the, uh, his uh, PhD, and research area experience in uh, uh, on vegetable breedings, potatoes, and other solanaceae 
includes all, all aspects of biotic stress and insect resistance. Uh, for experience, uh, since 2018, uh, as uh, heads of the Center for Tropical Horticulture Studies uh, in IPB University. Uh, Dr. Awang has uh, a lot of publications uh, with a total 46 articles uh, with Scopus Index uh, 9 and uh, mostly on uh, Solanaceae's uh, plants. So let's uh, go to the uh, presentations and we invite uh, Dr. Awang who presents uh, his uh, talk. And the next uh, 20 minutes are yours, uh, Dr. Awang. Thank you, Father Dra. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, morning. I hope uh, my voice is clear and my slides uh, is already seen in the in the screen. Uh, please uh, give feedback. Is that uh, okay, Father Dra? Okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. So uh, first, I would like to thank the organizing uh, committee for, for giving me an uh, opportunity to uh, uh, deliver a talk uh, about uh, my recent work in elucidating the mechanism of uh, insect resistance in pepper, uh, mostly use uh, molecular and met metabolomic approach. Uh, so uh, the outline of my presentation uh, is designed for uh, 30 minutes, but uh, I will try my best to deliver it in uh, 20 uh, minutes. Yeah, And if you need uh, more detail, just contact me because, uh, of course, this is a nice opportunity for us to have uh, uh, contact, uh, collaborations, and maybe arising some question to give us a new idea for doing uh, research in the future. So uh, my talk. Is about the pepper, yeah, and uh, we all know that pepper is one of the most produced vegetables in the world. And both dry and green uh, or fresh pepper uh, rapidly increase uh, uh, from the 90 to up to now. And it's look like the trend are still uh, increasing because uh, people know how to use uh, pepper uh, in a very, very uh, various way. And not only for for a diet, uh, pepper also uh, well known for uh, uh, health, yeah, and even for a defense against uh, uh, criminals. So, what is the problem with uh, pepper production? Yeah, in Indonesia, situation sometimes it give a headache for the government because the influence rate. Uh, infl uh, inflation rate of our country, uh, maybe uh, 12 percent or, or even more, is uh, uh, influenced by the the pepper production, and uh, it's even worse because the uh, pepper production uh, problem is not uh, only determined by the abiotic stress, for instance, but also the biotic stress, such as uh, from insect, fungi, bacteria, nematodes, and Many more. Therefore, the uh, pepper in Indonesia is one of the uh, priority commodity for for research and production, and we are very happy that uh, I think since uh, about three or four years ago, we 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 uh, elected uh, as a coordinator for the uh, priority research uh, flagship or national uh, uh, flagship program for. Pepper research. And uh, first, yeah, uh, to, to make it uh, more focused, I will talk first about the uh, trips. Yeah, uh, I will talk about insects in 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 in, pep in pepper. But first, I would like to start from the trips uh, because this is my uh, core uh, insect when I did uh, my uh, PhD, and up to now we still continue to work with it. Uh, why trips? Because trips are damaging pests in the pepper worldwide, uh, not only in Asia, but also in in Europe. Uh, they have uh, uh, trips, what we call the Franklinia occidentalis. And although it's different in the species, but it's interesting because in some uh, report, it sold uh, multiple uh, resistance against uh, uh, same species of trips. 
And trips, it can uh, cause direct and indirect damage, uh, such as uh, direct damage is like a cosmetic damage in the uh, fruits, yeah? And indirect damage is uh, even worse because it can transmit uh, many kind of virus. And uh, now trips rapidly develop resistance to pesticide. And until now, there are no commercial varieties of pepper with effective level of resistance to trips. And uh, when we deal with trips, of course, uh, we have potential also to limit the transmission of the virus. And as like I would, uh, already mentioned before, that uh, damage caused by, by virus can be up to 100%. So uh, we really need the resistant breeding because uh, several reports uh, try to uh, include the biological control, uh, cultural practices, and even the use of chemical control, but uh, still not enough. And of course, it will uh, increase the, the cost structure of the pepper production, which is not nice. Therefore, we should uh, also put uh, one factor in the IPM program that is the use of resistant variety. Uh, solely rely on the for resistant variety, of course, uh, also almost uh, impossible, if we, we could say that like that, yeah, because up, up to now, the, the, uh, it's very difficult to, to, to get the immune uh, genotype or variety. Yeah? But at least when we uh, incorporate this uh, resistant variety into the IPM program, maybe uh, the 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 cost can be cut and the productivity will be higher. So first is the resistance stores. Uh, uh, we first uh, start the program in two thousand and eight. Uh, if you look at this, uh, if you can, uh, yeah, if you can <laughs> see here, there's a uh, one uh, skinny uh, guy here. Yeah, it will do the who did the, the screening. Together with uh, uh, in the left, you see Pak Murianto that will be deliver some talk also uh, later to, on today. Uh, we we uh, try to find the source of the resistance, and we we did uh, with too many genotype both in uh, Indonesia and also in Netherlands, and we characterize uh, using molecular and metabolomic uh, technology at that time because uh, some uh, genotype we cannot uh, see uh, belongs to what uh, species. Therefore, we, we try to use uh, uh, molecular markers, uh, technology, and metabolomic analysis to make a groups of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, species. Because in the end, if we want to make a cross, of course, we should uh, calculate the possibility of uh, successfulness of the crossing uh, using uh, the material that we found. And uh, second, we did the uh, development of test method of phenot or, or phenotyping for insect resistance. Why? Because uh, working with two, yeah, uh, I mean the plants and the uh, uh, insects is very complex. When you put the three factors, the virus, it will be more complex yeah, because we need to synchronous the age of the uh, insect, the age of the plant, yeah. You can see here, this is me, uh, me also, uh, when we did the test uh, from uh, small plants to a very bigger plant here, the resistant effect is different, yeah. And also to synchronize the age of the virus, the, the female and male uh, of the, sorry, of the insect, it's really uh, need effort. Because if we do not uh, do that, then the variation uh, of the treatment will be, uh, yeah, we cannot control it. And that will be uh, not uh, nice at all. So we, we did the uh, uh, rearing of the insect in the chrysanthemum. Yeah? So I, I feed the chrysanthemum every day and then harvest it. And after that, put it in the cucumber. And after one day, I brush it off all of the adult and I, I got uh, yeah relatively uh, synchronized age of uh, uh, insect that I will use for uh, uh, screening. And the screening methodology, we include uh, many uh, ways, uh, methodology, such as a greenhouse, glass house, yeah, uh, cutting and individual kits like this, leaf this, uh, detached leaf. 
with many considerations at the time. And this already published in uh, UBTK in 2011, if you're interested uh, more about this. And we can see here clearly a uh, separation of the uh, resistance in the leaf disk test and which uh, correlates with the performance of the plant in the field. And we uh, found uh, a very nice uh, group of resistant and susceptible uh, uh, plants. And at the time, I, I directly, this is me in 2000. Uh, 11, yeah, if not in second, we, we made a cross uh, of, of this all uh, uh, genotype that we have. And uh, interestingly, in that uh, the correlation between the screen house leaf disc and detached leaf pass, both using uh, Parfis Venus in Indonesia and Franschilina Ogindentalis in Netherlands, uh, result a uh, high correlation. Therefore, we, uh, of course, in the end, we choose the in vitro test because it's relatively easy to conduct, less space, less time. And the plant from which leaf are tests remain uninfested and environmental factors uh, are better controlled. No complaint from the colleagues, uh, uh, from the others uh, researcher about contamination in the greenhouse, etc. And an advantage of the leaf beach test over the detached leaf is that the sample size is more standardized. And we continue uh, to see why uh, we, we decide to do this because when we uh, present our result, then there are many uh, questions arising because the, they, they say that uh, in our research is different, in our research is different. Therefore, we want to, to, to know a more depth about this about the, how the mechanism against uh, insect pests in the paper. So we try to detect the resistant factor in paper that inhibit larval, uh, I mean, inhibit the development of the trips. And uh, we, we use uh, uh, our collection that previously studied in 2011 and using uh, this uh, set of uh, genotype, uh, we try to see if there is a preference effect of the uh, resistant, for instance, the medium when uh, versus resistant, the medium uh, we expect to be more uh, susceptible and the medium versus susceptible, we expect that the medium will be resistant, but there is no uh, uh, clue about that. And then the second also, we try to do the X, uh, Y, uh, uh, a choice test, yeah, of uh, the trips using the resistant and susceptible, and still there are uh, no uh, significant difference. And uh, apart from that, we see uh, the effect of the, some uh, factors in the leaf that can prevent the uh, act of reposition. Yeah, and see that the resistance. Uh, uh, is less uh, larvae after several days compared to the susceptible. Therefore, we want to, to know more in which states are more uh, affected by the resistant factors. And uh, based on our result, we see that uh, from L1 to L2 uh, larva stage, the development of the L1 to L2 is the most uh, affected uh, by the resistant factors. Therefore, we decide to continue uh, with this as a base of the resistance uh, character yeah? uh, when we continue the project. And even we try also the uh, correlation with the morphological character, such as leaf color, leaf hairness, particular thickness, and uh, toughness. And uh, even at the time, we already used the F2 population, and we still detect no correlation at all. Therefore, we uh, continue to, to uh, study the more depth in the composition of the leaf. First, we did the pre-experiment using a uh, nine vapor accession with uh, the CMS. And interestingly, we can uh, see, we can detect some uh, uh, tocophero and uh, alkane, et cetera, are different uh, in uh, resistant compared to susceptible accession. Uh, 
this is our conclusion at the time. The ovulation rate and larva mortality are more important factors of resistant and pepper, and feeding states are likely to play dominant roles. And since the resistant action significantly affect the biology of the trips and do not support the development of the trip, therefore it's likely that antibiosis play a bigger role and not the antigenosis. And we uh, continue with the uh, QTL mapping to know uh, the which location of the QTL. Uh, so we use the interspecific cross of the genotype that we uh, uh, detect previously uh, the most resistant and susceptible. And we successfully uh, got uh, 12 uh, linkage, uh, linkage groups and comparable with uh, other uh, linkage map at the time. And also the distribution of the F1, F2, yeah, and the parents are nice. And uh, the most uh, important finding in this uh, uh, study is that we could find the uh, major KTL in chromosome six. That's explained more of uh, more than 50% uh, of the variation. And what is nice is at the time I already uh, continue to the F3 lines and the effect of the KTLs are uh, validated. And also we, as a control, we could find the uh, KTL for trichome and we exactly, precisely yeah, detect in the same uh, position as previously uh, reported by others uh, researcher from Korea. And also this is very interesting because the CM334 uh, next uh, used in our study uh, for the white fly resistance. And in uh, the same uh, population, because the fruits are also different, we would like to know if the fruits can also uh, have effect on the resistance, therefore, we uh, did uh, LCMS and GCMS in the fruits and try to uh, map it. And also some genes that are already known before for this uh, flavonoid uh, uh, content that we detect by the uh, metabolomic analysis we, we see here. But uh, unfortunately, there's no uh, interesting thing in the region of the resistant QTL. And uh, I, I continue to, to do after my PhD uh, to analyze the data. And uh, based on the result, yeah, it's very ob obvious that the metabol metabolites in the leaf and in the fruits are very different. And uh, we remap again the metabolites uh, in the leaf because we still have the F2 population. And we detect a uh, uh, metabolite, yeah, co-localized with the uh, KTL of the resistant to trips that we detected before. And based on our uh, finding, that some are associated with the uh, F8, uh, caterpillar, uh, etc. In, in others, uh, uh, crops, yeah. So if uh, the time's out, I will continue with this. Uh, with the other student, yeah. Uh, but yeah, uh, this is a very, uh, a very good news, yeah. At uh, uh, in the 2021, the chromosome six, yeah, and the QTL that I detected before are continued uh, studied by others, uh, uh, friend from Wageningen, other PhD student, and they try to validate again. Uh, because this QTL is very interesting. It's very major QTL in chromosome six. And previously, there is a report that uh, in chromosome five. But we uh, argue about that because uh, in the previous, uh, in chromosome five uh, QTL, they use uh, unsynchronized strips. But in my case, we use a synchronized strip. And uh, happily that the researcher finally validate our results. They found uh, uh, the effect again in the chromosome six. And even now they uh, start to uh, predict yeah, the genes uh, near the region and they uh, start 
and still ongoing to do the candidate change studies. Okay, and uh, that's about the trips. I hope I can continue with that. And this is the situation with our student in plant breeding and biotechnology uh, study program. Uh, we have a program for a white fly resistant, yeah, a white fly and virus resistant. Uh, this is uh, uh, Tewe. Uh, she is really hard worker. She uh, worked with this uh, and found a candidate for uh, yeah, a virus resistance. And then also another student, uh, Dian Kusumaning Ayu. Uh, she uh, really uh, able to show that. There is a resistance in analog that might associate with the uh, resistance to uh, the virus, yeah, yellow leaf growth disease. And this is interesting because actually that the uh, sequence identified yeah, identify, uh, at the time is, uh, yeah, of course, uh, there is a association with the big of virus, but we can see here that the white fly resistant protein from other uh, source uh, uh, from tomato, if I'm not yeah, from tomato, uh, it's also uh, associated. Yeah, and the, the genotype, yeah, the uh, variety that uh, contain that uh, resistant gene analog has a very good uh, resistant score compared to the one that uh, did not uh, uh, possess the resistant gene analog. And therefore, we uh, want to to uh, discriminate two, the two more minutes, Pak Awang. Yeah, yeah, brother. Just just a few slides more okay. uh, to 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 separate the effect of Germany virus and white fly. Yeah, and we see that yes, there's this uh, there is a difference effect. Yeah, and here you see Bonita is uh, maybe not uh, maybe not uh, resistant to virus, but it looked like a, a moderately a resistant to uh, white fly, and uh, the bonita is a product of uh, of sukur yeah, from our uh, department. And uh, come back with, with the separation of white fly and the Gemini virus uh, resistant. And uh, although it's looked like in the previous time it's formed together, but Actually, it's a very separate. Yeah? Therefore, we have a potential to breed for the white fire resistant and to breed for the virus resistant, and together we can incorporate to make it uh, more resistant. Yeah, and this this uh, uh, initiation now carried out by uh, Bu Erin in Hur. I hope uh, she will be success uh, for doing this. And the white fly also studied by Bu uh, Tanko Kamalia. Yeah? I hope uh, we will have a more publication about this because uh, it's very interesting because uh, trichome is more related and we can uh, map the trichome uh, previously. And I think uh, still ongoing, yeah, Pa Adi doing this and many publications he already uh, uh, produced and in the proceeding also. So maybe that's all uh, my story for the insect resistance in paper. I hope it can inspire you. And uh, of course, we are very welcome to, to, to welcome you in our uh, plant reading and biotechnical program uh, to join as a student or join as a uh, collaborator for research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pawang, for the interesting uh, uh, presentations and uh, there are several uh, questions in the chat box for you these answers in the chat box yeah, and, yeah. and thank you uh, let's move to the next speakers uh, the next speaker is uh, will be pa uh, morianto paiman magister uh, science uh, from the East West Seeds uh, Chapanamera, the best friends of uh, the farmers. Uh, the education of uh, Murianto is uh, BS from the Faculty of Agriculture, uh, Lampung University, and a master degree from Life Science and Technology from Bandung Institute of Technology. Uh, research area on uh, SNAP markers, double haploid QTL mapping, genome associate study, 
and trade predictions and uh, experience as uh, senior biotechnology laboratory managers from uh, east west uh, seeds indonesia uh, this uh, some courses workshop and seminars uh, in petrol technology application for agriculture research applied production of vegetable crops uh, in taiwan uh, summer class uh, and then uh, master class program on high throughput dna sequence analysis uh, wageningen university uh, we saw the photo from the pawang's presentations before and then uh, still a lot of other uh, courses workshop and seminar and uh, Pamorianto will talk uh, about uh, elucidating the resistant mechanism or oh, oh, sorry a genome based approach to speed up new variety release for Indonesian farmers so the next 20 minutes uh, are yours pa uh, Morianto uh, good luck Thank you, uh, Darda, and uh, also thank you for the whole committee that uh, gave uh, me the opportunity to uh, attend a nice seminar today. Uh, actually, in this room also there are many of uh, my colleagues that finally we meet again even uh, online. Pawang, nice presentation, Pawang. Uh, let me share thank my presentation. Know. Everyone, can you see my presentation already? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let uh, Let me start my uh, presentation then. Uh, how many minutes, Pak FND? My time. Twenty. Dua puluh, Pak. Okay, Pak. Thank you, Pak. Okay. Let's start. Uh, first is about. Uh, PT Specialist Indonesia, now we are uh, based in Purwakarta and focusing for Indonesian farmers. At uh, this time, uh, supported by uh, thousand local employees with more than seventy percent millennials. Now, I am become a minority here in the company because most of the uh, employees millennials now. Uh, partnering with uh, uh, seventy thousand growers and seventy thousand pollinators workers in some production area and producing more than uh, 150 high quality seed varieties uh, used for, by more than 7 million Indonesian vegetable farmers. This is some collaborations uh, we have with the university, with the company, with the institution and also with the high school. Uh, I always uh, put this uh, cycle of uh, variety development in our company in the presentation because this is uh, nice to share for all of the participants uh, about our activity here. So uh, everything is start with the consumer need. Uh, it's including the high yield with the disease resistance with nice appearance uh, good taste, nutritious, uh, good storability. And that's what we got from the market info uh, from the field, from a uh, whole area in Indonesia. Then uh, from that information, we start with uh, looking for the Jumplasm collections in our uh, gene bank. If then uh, all available, then we start the breeding process. But if not available, we are looking for the that gene plasm. We have uh, many collaboration with some of the uh, gene bank around the world. So uh, after the gene, uh, gene, gene plasm is available, then we start the breeding process where uh, 100% we did in Indonesia. A, a, uh, we uh, start with a collaboration among breeder with uh, plant pathology laboratory, with biotech laboratory, with farm department, 
uh, to do the uh, uh, sum of activity in the uh, breeding process. And then after we have, uh, let's say, uh, some interesting lines, then we did the yield test. And from that yield test, we will have some uh, a candidate from R&D, which uh, we can put in the multi-location test, yeah, in uh, some area in Indonesia. Then after the uh, uh, evaluation, and also we ask the farmers, also the marketing team, to see the trial in the multi-location test. Then we will have the some selected uh, lines that uh, will become the new uh, variety candidate, yeah. And then from that candidate, then we commercialize after we collaborate with the seed operation division to prepare the uh, commercial seed. Then after that, the cycle is always uh, uh, start. Uh, continuing. That is about the cycle. And here we are, uh, the activity of the genetic uh, based approach uh, or GB Pro, it's uh, located. And when we are talking about the breeding journey, uh, I combine with the, our timeline in the background that. Uh, uh, we start at 1990 uh, till today. So at that time in the beginning, we are starting with the, with the yield. We are uh, starting with the open pollination at the beginning. And then also with the uh, time by time, then we are also uh, looking for the appearance and also for, also for the storability. Uh, then continue with the disease resistance. Uh, which all already we, we then produced the hybrid in 1992. Uh, Mustang F1 uh, hybrid F1 is our first uh, hybrid uh, eggplant. Uh, and then uh, after that uh, period, then more and more hybrid uh, we can produce. Then in 1996, uh, we have a facility in uh, pathology. And then 1997, we have in tissue culture. And uh, a bit longer, then we have a molecular laboratory in 2012. Uh, and then uh, the journey is still, still continue. And uh, hope that we can also uh, uh, have a uh, uh, more technology and more reading objective for the future. And of course, by this uh, occasion also, uh, we expect that we'll also invite the collaboration from uh, uh, from institute or from research institute or from also from the university. So, uh, Genome-based approach actually uh, just uh, uh, optimizing the genome information to make the breeding program more effective. Uh, we call it genome-based approach or GB Pro. Why? Because I, what we do is a uh, hundred percent is based on the genome data. Uh, today, the activity is supported by the capability of the DNA extraction for 5,000 sample a day. And for the PCR, we have a machines, uh, many machines that can run about uh, 12,000 data point uh, for one day. And also we have a genotyping machine that can uh, do the SNP genotyping machine for 20,000 data point a day. And uh, starting for three years ago, we also uh, finally have an in-house genome database of uh, 38 species. Uh, 
and each species also uh, uh, contain some uh, some exceptions and the uh, amounts is uh, always growth every year because we have the regular uh, sequencing project this is a from common vegetable in indonesia and we combine also the genome data with the uh, data that we got from the public uh, database uh, now also we have an in-house genome browser that we can uh, use uh, offline because all of the software of, of the database is we put in our own server so it's uh, uh, it's very efficient if we, uh, we are talking about the uh, public database uh, because of the internet connectivity uh, we are not using any net we are not need the internet connectivity anymore and also we can combine with our own uh, genome database so we can explore more and we can learn more from that uh, database by using the genome browser uh, for the marker we have a, a SNP marker uh, today we only we are only focusing on the SNP markers we have a, a one 163 sleep marker for traits and for fingerprinting uh, for uh, uh, tomato, pepper, uh, cucumber, watermelon, eggplant, pumpkin, melon, and others. Uh, and also we have uh, more than 500 markers set for MABC program. And up to now we uh still have a regular sequencing program by using ngs uh, that we only send the sample to the vendor because uh it's 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 uh, the reason is just cheaper and faster this is is the uh our in-house genome browsers looks like it's it's simple it's not sophisticated like uh, maybe you see in the public uh, genome browser but at least by this kind of uh, genome browser we can uh, study our uh, material that we already put in the uh, in the database and uh, something interesting also that i would like to share to the participant is a uh, that we use some tools to accelerate the process of uh, GP Pro or genome-based approach. We have a double haplet uh, production protocol here at the window. A, because a hundred percent homozygous line is needed to accelerate the marker development uh, process, and also, of course, uh, it's a, it's a needed by a, during the breeding program and for today we have many available protocol uh, including for the pepper all pepper uh, big pepper curly pepper and also bird pepper or chaberawit we have also uh, tomato uh, protocol we have eggplant protocol cucumber watermelon salad cauliflower broccoli and joshim and the other tool that is also powerful to accelerate the process is we are doing the regular disease mapping in Indonesia, in all province. And also we have the facility that we can detect the pathogen by molecular approach. So uh, from this result, then we know the uh, detailed information about the disease, what we deal with, and then by that uh, uh, information, then we can clearly develop the marker uh, that really needed for the breeding program. And where the genome based approach uh, in the breeding program here, uh, if you uh, see the uh, slide uh, before, 
this is just the zoom in of the slide. And then in the breeding process, the genome-based approach or GB Pro is uh, uh, supported by the double haploid uh, production and also the specific pathogen information. Then by that information, we are working to support the breeding process by giving them with the uh, matter acceleration by uh, uh, MABC or uh, also the depend on the trade. Uh, so we expect that by this contribution, then the breeding process is going faster. This is some activities in uh, our GB Pro uh, program at a window. So we have a molecular acid selection portrait. It's uh, including the disease resistance and agronomical traits. And also we have molecular acid back crossing. We did, uh, we are doing the foreground and background selection in our material. I, uh, we also have the algorithm to do the trade prediction uh, for the disease resistant and agronomical traits. Uh, then we also have the genome wide association study uh, in uh, some crop for developing markers. Of course, it's very uh, helpful for us by using this uh, approach. Uh, and then we also have DNA fingerprinting for uh, parental and commercial seeds. So uh, by using the DNA fingerprinting, we assure that all seed before we uh, give to the farmer, it's already uh, passed the test and uh, we did a uh, biomolecular uh, approach. We are using a SNP marker to do the uh, fingerprinting and also for the all parental before we uh, used for the production, uh, we ensure that all parental is 100% homozygous for both parental. So uh, that will then make the process uh, uh, easier. And today we are still on the preparing database algorithm and knowledge to entering the genomic selection uh, phase. Okay, this is, is our work for the uh, Indonesian paper. We do the genetic mapping uh, based on the Gemini virus resistance, because uh, as we know that uh, Gemini virus is, uh, is uh, one of the most, or let's say number one enemy for the Indonesian farmers. Uh, at the time we select 66, uh, paper uh, panel as a panel. And then uh, by using the genotyping based sequencing, we create the genome data. Uh, and this uh, linkage maps, uh, linkage map is, we create by using more than a hundred thousand, uh, than a thousand selected SNP marker. Yeah, all the selected marker is related with the uh, uh, Gemini virus resistant. And now uh, we have, uh, the markers already, and we are using for our routine uh, breeding program here in the window. And this is, is the GWAS in tomato for the developing uh, trade marker. Uh, this uh, study is we uh, create by using uh, more than 10,000 uh, markers. Yeah, and uh, from that uh, marker, then we have interesting information related to the trait in uh, each chromosome, which each trait. So uh, uh, it's very useful information for us. And then if you see in the left, uh, you see the court diagram is also, uh, uh, we see uh, each, uh, each trait that the correlation with the which chromosome. So this is uh, uh, GWAS in tomato. Uh, and this is the trade prediction uh, for the Gemini region uh, in paper. Uh, we are using uh, this uh, prediction 
after long uh, long experiments with the uh, many markers and then finally we uh, focus on the seven marker it's trade and the prediction is uh, we test with the uh, uh, with the table this you see if you see the prediction the accuracy uh, we check the accuracy uh, of the prediction and uh, so far we happy with the accuracy and we still uh, would like to increase the accuracy uh, then the expectation is of course by the prediction we will also have a, uh, let's say we can accelerate the process because uh, the observation in the field is uh, just for the confirmation. And this is the MABC by using uh, more than 500 markers. Um, this uh, MABC we did with uh, uh, still uh, the Gemini virus resistant in the paper. Uh, we're doing the foreground selections at the beginning and then after we got uh, the result then we uh, did the background selection and uh, yeah uh, this uh, still on uh, going with the result and we hope that it will uh, finish uh, soon so i think my time is already up uh, thank you. Uh, hope that the information is uh, useful and uh, question are welcome. Thank you, Pak Dada. Thank you, Pak Morianto. Very nice and interesting topics and presentations. Uh, there are several uh, questions in the chat box, so you can uh, answer. Uh, and we still have some times if uh anybody would like to uh have a direct questions please or i think i already answer all the question in the chat but and some for okay. Pak murianto have been uh not answered maybe yeah okay okay Pawang is already answers all of the question in the chat room, uh, chat box. Okay, thank you, Pawang. And uh, Pak Murianto, maybe you can answer us directly. Uh, uh, please, uh, Mas, uh, siapa Adi atau siapa tampilkan itu uh, pertanyaan, uh, question for Pak Mur. Mas Zul, okay, thank you, Mas Zul. Uh, Okay, this is a question by Amur. Yeah, Pak. I still try to answer in the uh, in the chat, Pak. Okay. Yeah. Oh, you can answer directly. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. For this question, actually, it's uh, it's very depend on the material that we have, but uh, let's say for the speeding up the process by using the. Uh, GB Pro, let's say we can uh, speed up the process 30 till 40% uh, of the uh, duration. Pa. Okay, for example, from uh, four years to uh, three years, for example, so from five to... Yes, especially then when we have the, the double hybrid protocol, then it will more faster. Yeah. Okay. Sure. So, how long the longest process and the, the shortest process for the breeding? The longest can be 10, 10 years, but 10 years, okay. yes. From the experience of the breeder, yeah. Okay, the question from Bu Yudi Wanti Wahyu. Uh, since, okay, uh, since we are showing the monocular approach, uh, for the varieties, uh, if, if you see the varieties that uh, we released after 2013, let's say, it's already uh, using the Molokar approach. Uh, so, uh, honestly, 
for detail, I didn't uh, remember what kind of the variety, but for sure, uh, the variety that we released uh, from 2013, pepper, uh, cucumber, and tomato, uh, it already include the molecular technology. Thank you, Pak. Okay. Thank you. Okay, from Pak Muhammad Shafi'i. Working with hybrid breeding mean the technological system for purpose. Okay, uh, yeah, for the recalcitrance, uh, honestly, I have no experience for that. But based on our experience, that what we work with, what uh, the species that I mentioned in my presentations, we are uh, succeed to produce um, many embryos uh, for tomato, pepper, eggplant, uh, cucumber. So we have no problem with very with the uh, recalcitrance. Hope that will answer your question, Pak Muhammad Safi. And then the next question already finished. Okay. There is one question from Pak Moore actually. The possibility for working with the uh, working at the East West seats. Can fresh graduate of the millennial doctoral program join the visual seats in Indonesia? Of course, Pak. Oh, sure. For, yeah. Yeah. for sure, I said yes. It's possible, Pak. Possible. Yes. So, Pak Zul, just uh, context, Pak Moore. Okay. okay. Oh, Pak Zul Fikar, ya? Fikar. Yeah. Okay, we still have time. If uh, any audience have uh, questions, please just raise your hands. No more. Oh, I give the time to Pawang if you have a review of the uh, all of the questions and answer short, uh, short time in short time, Pawang. Okay, thank you, Padata. So, uh, uh, thank you for the the question. Uh, yeah, um, mostly uh, it's about the correlation of the metabolomics and the resistance and. Uh, up to now, uh, and also based on the newest uh, result that the uh, group from Rahaningen have, uh, there's no obvious link of evidence. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, there is no uh, obvious uh, evidence that the link of the metabolic, uh, metabolites uh, or specific metabolites and uh, uh, resistant factors uh, represented by the QTL uh are uh, linked or correlated some uh, groups yeah from uh, others uh, department they they still working on the artificial uh, or some substance that can uh, inhibit the development of the uh, trips but uh, yeah uh, they they work uh, uh, what you in in different direction so they, they, they first try many uh, substances that might inhibit and then try to get a, a clue for candidate genes from that uh, metabolomic. And they uh, work with the dat database. And up to now, there are still no promising results uh, as well. So maybe it's a different mechanism. <laughs> maybe the insect uh, not really correlated with the or have a small effect uh, by the metabolites. Maybe there's other uh, uh, factors that might more influence of the development of the uh, insect in the plant. Maybe that's uh, my uh, additional answer. Okay. Thank you, Pa Awang. Uh, and Pa Murianto, if you have a final conclusion or final review of your presentation, please. Okay, Pak Darda, thank you. Uh, yes, thank you again for the opportunity because uh, uh, we can uh, introduce what we 
doing at a window. Of course, by this introduction, then we also looking for the uh, collaboration possibilities because as the researcher in the private sector, uh, we are uh, doing a routine and sometimes we uh, lost by time is gradu gradually lost the scientific thing is not like, uh, as detailed as the college in the university or in the institution so uh, yeah we hope that by this opportunity we can find more possibility to have collaboration of course and uh, from the presentation uh, we are in the private sector uh, it, it's really uh, helped by the technology uh, by the molecular like uh, professor uh, Witaru and also Bu uh, Ning and Pa Wang mentions about the about the capability of the technology uh, can do uh, to supporting the breeding program so here in in, 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 in our uh, place here in the company we, we we can prove it in the in the field and uh, it's it's uh, enhanced the 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 work and also accelerate the program so uh, and then by the using of other tools like double haploids and also the uh, exact uh, the information about the disease what we uh, uh, face off in the in the in the field, the then the molecular technology is it's very powerful for the breeding program. So uh, and again uh, for millennials, we are welcome. <laughs> we are welcome. Uh, I'm millennial too. Man. Yeah, for our still millennial. Yeah, for <laughs> 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 uh, we are welcome and. Yeah. Also, let's collaborate. There are many things that we can collaborate. We are we are need collaborations. I think that's all, Pak Darda. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Pak Murianto. And luckily, I'm a baby boomers. <laughs> we we also have uh, submit a new program with uh, East West Pak Murianto for yes. for sure, training. Uh, yeah, uh, soon the proposal accepted. We will announce to the. Uh, audience also if they can uh, apply to join the, the training yeah. thank nice you one. it's always you. it's always a uh, uh, pleasure to have collaboration with IPB yeah thank good you luck. Yeah. Uh, good luck Pak Wang and Pak Morianto for the collaborations so uh, so we finish the this uh, second session and let's uh, give a big applause to the speakers Dr Awang dan Pak Morianto Master of Science And uh, I will give the time back to the MC, to the Mbak Rahma. Uh, please, Mbak Rahma. Yes, thank you very much, Professor Derda, for bringing us to a very fun and insightful session today. Also, we say thank you to Dr. Awang and Pak Murianto for a nice presentation and discussion which have enriched our knowledge. Yeah. I kindly remind to all of the participants who are joining this seminar, both through this Zoom meeting and the YouTube channel, to fill in the form of attendance, which has already been shared in the chat box. Also, for who want to access the presentation materials from the today's presenters, you could download it uh, through the shared link. And also, one more, one more announcement that I get to share you that we have a happy news that plant breeding and biotechnology study program just opened registration for um, graduate and postgraduate school for 2020, eh, sorry, 20 and 2003 until 2024 academic year. Let's join us at plant breeding and biotechnology study program. Ladies and gentlemen, our seminar is completely over. We say thank you very much for all of the speakers and moderators. And the next agenda is handover of certificates of appreciation to the speakers.
The certificates for the speakers of first session and second session will be delivered by the head of Agronomy and Horticulture Department, Professor Eddie Santosa, please. Yeah, the okay. first certificates <clears throat> will be awarded to Professor Wataru Sakamoto. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much, Professor uh, Wataru Sakamoto for your nice presentation. And uh, this is our certificate. Thank you very much for your time and your and your uh, how to say what to share your experience to us. And we hope in the near future we'll have a future collaboration. I think uh, in our university, uh, some researchers, including uh, Dr. Nining, is a uh, work hard on uh, sorghum, and uh, also part of our college also working hard on the uh, heavy metals on rice. So maybe we'll have uh, some uh, insight mm -hmm. on your side. Thank you very much, uh, uh, much. Thank you very much. The next uh, to Dr. Nining, uh, Dr. Trikusumaning Tias, thank you very much for your nice uh, presentation. I think uh, it's very, how to say, useful for uh, researchers in the preliminary careers and uh, it's very strong background and we do hope that in the near future uh, Buniling and uh, Sakamoto Sensei will have a collaboration on Sorghum. Thank you very much Buniling for your sharing and your time. And uh, for pa Dr. Awang Maharijaya, thank you very much for your nice presentation on chili and uh, some uh, biotechs related to the chili improvement. And also you are sharing a very nice publication. And thank uh, you from, from your students. Thank you very much, Pa Awang, for your thank insight. You. And Pa Morianto Paiman, thank you very much for your information about the uh, this West and also the experience and uh, sharing and uh, your spirit to all of us. And we hope in the near future, uh, we how to say, get a stronger collaboration. And we also do hope that uh, the proposal that submitted to uh, Nufik will success. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much, Pa Murianto, for your time and uh, the sharing. Thank you, Pai. And for very nice moderator, Pa Willy Bayuardi Suwarno, thank you very much for your time and uh, timely uh, manage uh, the discussion and also the presentation. Thank you very much, Pa Willy. Thank you very much, Pai D. Very much appreciated. And finally, Professor Dada, thank you very much for your uh, very nice leading in the discussion and also the presentation. Uh, this is our certificate. Uh, we hope that uh, your, yeah. um, uh, how your method to manage the uh, discussion part will be useful for us as, uh, how to say, uh, youngs to learn from the senior. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Eddie. And finally, for Ms. Rahmatun Niswa Mahfiroh for the very nice uh, organizing uh, the session from the early end to the end of the session. Thank you very much, Ba Rahmatun Niswa Mahfiroh. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for the uh, opportunity and experience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Professor Eddie. Once more, we, uh, we will say thank you very much for all of the speakers and moderators for this uh, session, for this webinar. Last but not least, uh, on behalf of Plant Breeding and Biotechnology Study Program, we would like to say thanks to East West East Indonesia or Ewindo, Sahabat Petani Yang Paling Baik, we would like to say uh, thank you for uh, Forscha who already 
manage this webinar. So, uh, it will be such a nice webinar series. Also, thank you very much to all of the participants who already active for the participation in this webinar. And I wish you all a pleasant day. See you in the next seminar. I'm Rahmat Tunisul Maghfiro signing off. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. 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 Terima kasih. Thank you. See you. See you, Professor. Terima kasih. 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 Terima Terima kasih Bu Dewi undangannya. Mohon semoga tidak mengecewakan. Oh, mantap, mantap, mantap semua.